All right, how's everybody doing? Uh, my name is Skylar St. Ives. Uh, I am a information and education specialist for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife, and I specialize as the state's aquatic education um, and fishing coordinator. And today, this course uh, is part of our new monthly Ask an Angler series, and we're going to cover all things trout. So for anybody who is in here, um, if you have any questions at any point um, during, uh, just put it into the chat bar and I'll address them along the way. Uh, we won't go all the way to the end and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. But if we're covering a topic and I went too fast or you're interested in it, uh, we got two hours, so we have plenty of time. So any questions, just put them over into the chat bar um, and we're going to get started here. So trout fishing in Oklahoma. Um, while we have two year-round trout fisheries at the Lower Mountain Fork and the Lower Illinois River, most people think about trout in Oklahoma between November and March as a wintertime fishery um, for seasonal stockings. So we uh, have six seasonal areas as well as two urban areas. Uh, in the Tulsa area, in Jinx, we have Veterans Park Pond, which is stocked uh, from December through February, as well as Delisi Park Pond in Oklahoma City. The bigger lakes and creeks that are stocked annually uh, for the seasonal trout between November 1st and the end of April are going to be uh, Sunset Lake. We moved from uh, Carl Etling, which if anybody's familiar with that, that's at the very northwestern tip of the panhandle. Didn't get a lot of pressure, and um, we've had issues with the dam and uh, water levels there. So this past year, we actually moved that northwestern trout fishery from Carl Etling to uh, Sunset Lake, which is in Guymon. And our other northwestern trout area is Watonga, um, which is just north of the town of of Watonga. And then down in the Southwest, we have Medicine Creek, which is located right there in Medicine Park. It is the tailwater of Lake Latonka. And then we have Blue River in the South Central, which is located just south of Ada and just north of Tishomingo. Um, and then in our Northeastern area, we have Perry Triple C Lake, which is located about a mile south of the town of Perry. So what we're going to be talking about, uh, to answer Philip, is Pawhuska getting stock? No. So uh, we ended the partnership with Lake Pawhuska, and those fish are now stocked in Perry Triple C each year. So the three basic trout fishing principles in Oklahoma, um, most effective way to catch trout, are going to be uh, either cast and retrieve, which is, you're going to be using small lures, spoons, things like that. Bottom fishing, which is going to be associated with bait, um, primarily power bait. Some people use corn, other people use worms, um, and then fly fishing. So all of the fish that we have in Oklahoma, while there is a little bit of evidence of reproduction in the lower mountain fork, um, these fish are stocked. So they are not wild fish when they go into a creek system, river system, or any of these bodies of water. So they were born and raised in hatcheries, which if anybody's ever been to a hatchery, it's not a lot of space. Um, they're fairly small rearing ponds, and these fish grow up eating primarily fish pellets. So their relationship, um, if you're a serious trout angler, if you've gone and fished uh, wild streams on the East Coast or the West Coast or up north, um, and you hear people talking about, you know, matching the hatch if you're fly fishing and um, things like that. Oklahoma trout uh, are a little different. Um, you really have the most success fishing for them with bait, uh, while small lures and spoons and fly fishing are are pretty much equally as effective. But understanding how those trout um, live while they're stocked, um, they're seasonal because outside of Watonga, where there's a small chance you could have some carryover from spring fed from the bottom of that lake, trout will not survive uh, the water temperatures in Oklahoma over the summer months. So Medicine Creek, uh, Perry Triple C, Blue River, um, Sunset Lake, and those ones, those fish aren't going to survive. So you're going to start to see a keel over depend on uh, what time of year and how hot it gets. Usually May, end of April, but probably by the end of May, most of those trout die off. Uh, Perry Triple C, we've actually introduced our Florida largemouth into that lake. 
um, because they will eat those trout uh, as they start to come and get active in February and March and those water temps start to warm up a little bit. And then those trout get a little sluggish. They're going to, they're going to predate on them while they're still alive. And they'll also clean them up as those fish die from uh, elevated water temperatures. Trout like water anywhere between the low forties and the high fifties. Um, it takes us a long time to get into that range in Oklahoma. So the fish that are stocked in November, um, water temperatures are typically in the upper 60s, mid to upper 60s, maybe even 70s. Uh, we had a colder than, we had a below average September and October, but now we're kind of having an above average November. So um, the trout are a little bit sluggish. Uh, fishing really doesn't pick up uh, at the seasonal areas until December, January, when those water temperatures really start to dive down into the 50s. And um, well, all of your warm water species, your bass, your crappie, your catfish, your sunfish, well, they start to go dormant with those lower water temperatures because they're warm water species, those trout actually get more active. Um, so we're going to talk about how we're going to target those fish as if you were um, you know, targeting your warm water species in the spring, the summer, and the fall. So I'm going to start with cast and retrieve first. Um, if this is for people who are, you're going to be using spin casting equipment or sp open face spinning reels. Um, I have something behind me here, the typical setup for Oklahoma. Um, this is a five foot two inch micro light rod. Uh, it's rigged with a little olive green, or I think the brand calls it a frog green, uh, vibric rooster tail. And, you know, we have a small, small open face spinning reel that's spooled with six pound test. Um, most of the trout that get stocked in the state are going to be somewhere between 10 and 14 inches. That's kind of the cookie cutter size. Those fish are going to range anywhere from three quarters of a pound to a pound and a half. Um, we do get brooder fish that are mixed in. So every body of water that we have, there is the opportunity for, you know, a five, six, seven pound fish to be stocked. Um, because like I said, outside of the lower Illinois and the lower mountain fork, where those are cold water discharges, where those fish can survive annually um, with the water temperatures, where they can have natural growth and get to certain lengths and sizes, you don't get that at the seasonal trout fisheries. So those fish are not going to grow during that period in any substantial length or um, weight. So you're going to have a healthy mixture of, uh, you know, 10, 12, 14 inch fish. And then you're also going to have your 16, 18, 20 inch fish that get mixed in. And then some of those brooder fish, which are going to be 20 plus inches. And any, any trout, any rainbow trout that's over 20 inches is probably going to be somewhere between three and six pounds, depending on girth, length. Um, some of the fish are long, long and skinny. They might be 24 inches and, you know, they might only be four pounds and you might get a 20 inch fish that's built like a football and it's going to be closer to four or five pounds. So typically six pound test, light action rod, it's most fun to play them on. Um, if you're looking to catch and keep, and, you know, you don't want to lose fish, I would recommend maybe using like a six and a half, like a bass rod, six and a half, seven foot rod with like eight or 10 pound test on it. Um, so for our cast and retrieve, I really like to simplify um, my fishing, no matter what species I'm targeting or how I'm fishing. Um, I really don't like to have a lot of gear with me. So the more that I can identify what works, what doesn't, and consolidate how I can carry, I have my... My three boxes of, of spinning equipment here that I use, the, these are pretty much my always go-to, and these are going to be uh, an assortment of rooster tails in olive green, brown, black, a little bit of brown and red, and then white, and then um, some green and red little tubes. Uh, the brown, these, these two colors seem to do the best at our seasonal trout fisheries something, you know, that's in this kind of brown color. This is just your very standard rooster tail. Um, and then for the olive colors here, you know, we have one that is cylindrical and then the other one that's more like a cone. And this one's a vibric rooster tail. I like these a lot. They have really good action in the water. Um, sometimes these more cylindrical ones, it's tough 
especially in flowing water to get the blade moving because you need a little bit of tension to keep that blade running. So if you're using a uh, cast and retrieve with, especially with rooster tails where there is a blade and it's an inline spinner, it's not offset like a, um, you know, a bass spinner bait where you have the big long 90 degree arm on it. This is in line. So this blade right here, it only rotates if there's tension. So if you cast up river and you have flowing water, if you're not reeling fast enough and there's not enough tension on the line, it's going to flutter through the water like this and it's not going to do what it's intended and those fish usually won't um, go after it. So with rooster tails, if you're fishing in any of our rivers that have trout in them or creeks, anything with flowing water, you're going to be wanting to cast either um, perpendicular with the flow. So you know, straight across, if you were standing, the water's moving through, you want to cast this way, or maybe even slightly downstream, depending on flow. So these right here, you really don't want to use more than a 16th ounce. They're, uh, unless you're fishing in one of the lakes, like if you're at Watonga or Perry, and you want to make a really long cast and have that sink, you might uh, opt for an eight, eighth of an ounce. But if you're fishing the lower mountain fork, the Blue River, the lower Illinois, um, you know, even most of Perry, those are really, really shallow bays that run through there, the coves, and those fish will stack up in there. You're only dealing with water depths that are, you know, less than eight feet. So you want to be right in the middle of the water column at 16th ounce, even a 32nd ounce will do that trick. Um, you don't want to be banging these along the bottom. They have treble hooks on them. They're going to catch. They're going to snag. Um, you know, these aren't the most expensive lures in the world, but, you know, they're three bucks a pop. So, you don't, you want to try to eliminate those types of things, especially in a lake where you may not be able to get it back a river. You might be able to wade out and, and retrieve it. But so what trout are looking for, um, you know, when they're attacking these types of lures is it's more of a reactionary bite. Um, you know, like I said, these fish, they're pellet raised. So when they get stocked into our bodies of water, it is a complete culture shock for them. It usually takes them a few days to settle in. So if you're the type of person who watches our trout stocking reports or you're calling our biologists asking them, hey, when was it stocked? That is not a great indication of when you're going to have success, especially early season. Um, we put these fish in. And like I said, if the water temperatures are still in the mid to upper 60s, you're going to have very minimal success with trout. Uh, even once they start to settle in, it's going to be a very slow bite. Those fish are going to retreat to the deeper water out in the middle find the thermocline, find some good oxygen and just kind of stabilize themselves until those water temperatures and the dissolved oxygen levels come up. And then they really start to, you know, kind of figure out their surroundings. But again, they're ingrained to be fed a few times a day um, with pellets. So uh, when the water gets colder and we're looking for that reactionary bite with, you know, things like rooster tails, um, Another, another real uh, good lure selection in Oklahoma are super dupers. They come in lots of different shapes and sizes, but again, 16th ounce, 32nd ounce, really don't want to get much more than that. But, you know, these gold ones, they work really well. They're very effective. Um, if you're not, uh, if you're more of a novice uh, angler, like as far as cast and retrieve goes, um, these feel a little weird on the end of your line because they're light and they don't, you know, they're meant to be fished erratically. So when you're pulling this through the water, there's obviously it's an open, open concept type deal on here. So that it's swimming through the water like this, but it's, it's going up and down left and right, but it feels weird. You know, you don't have, when you using an inline spinner or any type of cast and retrieve where there's tension on the line, you have that the whole way in. So it's very consistent with, um, you know, lures like these and spoons, even on a straight retrieve, you'll get slack in your line. It'll, you know, it'll move. But when you get that bite, that bite's going to be a hammer because, you know, it's not just going like this. It's very motion. So you might have some slack in your line. That fish comes up and grabs it. And the next reel, all of a sudden it's, you know, fish on. So rooster tails, super dupers, um, and then spoons, I don't have any real good spoons on me, but like little Cleo's, the little Cleo brand, golden orange um, seems to be kind of the hot ticket. Um, and that kind of reflects what I was talking about with the rooster tails, like brown being a very good color, you know, gold as opposed to silver. Now you can get some predatory bites from some bigger fish that 
uh, those brooder fish that we stock, you know, they've had a lot longer of a lifespan in those rearing ponds. And so they might turn to eating smaller fish that are in there. Usually hatcheries try to separate those fish out as they grow. So they don't have that type, but every now and then, you know, hatchery ponds, they get birds will drop small fish in. you'll get a mixture of, you know, minnows and other types of fish that will end up into these rearing ponds. So, you know, something maybe in like a trout color, that's something that they're used to seeing a little super duper like that. That's very effective as well. Um, and instead of sizing up your bait, like my recommendation when I said, you know, 16 uh, ounce to 32nd ounce, um, if you need to get deeper in the water column, instead of sizing up your lure to do that, using split shot, um, you know, little piece of split shot about six or eight inches in front of your lure, you know, start with one and see where you're at in the water column. If you need to put on more, put on more. Um, but doing that to keep your lure size as small as possible, even on a big trout, you know, a 16 plus inch trout, its mouth is not like a bass or a crappie or a catfish. You know, they're not getting that big wide extension They're They're more conal shaped in the front. So it's like this. So, you know, their area to actually open up to get something. Um, and then the way that they're shaped, you know, they're coming back like this. Whereas most of our fish in Oklahoma, when they're opening their mouths, crappie, bass, whatever, it's like this and it's a vacuum. So the smaller lures that you can use, the smaller hooks you can use when you're using bait, the smaller flies you can use, you're going to be more effective and more successful with getting bit and then having success with getting hooked up because trout are notorious for swinging and missing. Um, they, they like to attack like any other fish. They're going to attack from below and from behind. Um, and it, when they're chasing lures, now, if you're in a river and you're fly fishing, they're obviously waiting for something to come down, but they're still trying to hit it from below. But because of their mouth, they miss a lot um, just because of the way they're shaped. Even when they're taking bait, you know, they're, they peck at bait. It's not like a catfish bite where you have bait out and all of a sudden they grab it and your line goes tight and your rod doubles over. Trout, they're going to hit on bait and it's going to be, your tip of your rod's going to go. And that's just them pecking at that bait. Um, and we'll get, we'll get into that here in a second. Um, let me see. Uh, are spinners any good in Oklahoma for trout? Yeah. Inline spinners, um, to answer, just keep trucking on. Um, Spinners, inline spinners, rooster tails and in brown and olive are your two most effective colors. Um, you might may try white, you may try black, you may try kind of a hybrid red brown, something like that. But just your basic uh, wardens or Yakima baits, rooster tails in a 16th ounce or 32nd ounce, those are going to catch fish all over Oklahoma, um, no matter what body of water it is. Um, but you really again, other than our cold water year round discharges, trout fishing at these seasonal areas really does not start to get really good until you, you get additional stockings as well. So you're, you know, more fish per acre. That first dump comes in on November 1st and there's only probably 2,500 fish. Well, by the time you hit January, there's maybe 10,000, 12,000 fish in that body of water. The water temperatures are colder and so you're seeing a lot, you'll see that success rate pick up. And that isn't necessarily a byproduct that you would think of with like warm water species. You know, you hear people in the spring, like crappie fishing's picking up, white bass fishing's picking up. Um, that's a byproduct of the environment and everything else that's going on with their um, reproduction cycle. With trout, especially at the seasonal trout fisheries, trout fishing is picking up with the water temperature, but also because there are more fish in a body of, in a seasonal body of water in January than there is in November. Um, because you only have a six daily limit. None of these places get hit hard enough to really take a substantial dent on each stocking. So by the time that you hit late December, January, honestly, I think the best time to fish for trout in any of the seasonal areas in Oklahoma is going to be the last two weeks of January and the first two weeks of February. Your water temperatures are going to be at their coldest then. Um, you get a lot of really high pressure bluebird uh, sunny days, which warms up the surface level. So your winter mayfly hatches and midges are coming off as well. And those fish will start to key in. They've had a couple, two to three months to really adjust to the water. Um, 
So, you know, we have mayflies all throughout the state. We have midges, things like that. So after a couple of months, you'll really start to see, especially on areas like Watonga, um, Perry Triple C, you can really see that surface rising. Sometimes it's it, the water will be boiling. Um, and that's just them coming after emerging mayflies and nymphs and or midges, excuse me. We'll get into that when we get into the fly fishing section um, part of this course. So uh, let me see, we got one more. Uh, when you get, would you comment on whether San Juan? Yes. When we get, we'll do fly fishing last. Um, if nobody has any questions on cast and retrieve, uh, I think the one thing I didn't touch on is just retrieval speed. Again, if you're casting into flowing water, you know, when it hits the water, engage that reel. A lot of times what you can do to get that inline spinner working quickly is the second it hits the water, hook set. So what you would normally do if you had a bite, when that thing hits the water and right as it submerges, do like you would if you were hook setting. And that will actually flip that blade over. And then when you start retrieving, it's already in motion. A lot of times you'll cast out and you'll start to reel it in and you'll it'll feel like a tumbling motion. And that's just because that blade didn't get going. So the body of the lure is working against that blade because it's not spinning. So it's going to feel really weird. And then there's other times where you're, you'll cast out, you'll hit the wind or something like that. And your line will actually get trapped around the end of the hook. Um, and then that will cause that disturbance as well. But um, your retrieval speed should be slow. Um, if you can have that blade moving, as long as you can feel the tension, um, it's not as important with spoons and super dupers because they, they don't have a blade and they are meant to swim erratically. But for trout, as slow as possible for retrieval speed, as slow as you can keep a blade moving um, and you can keep a lure off the bottom. So just, but steady, you don't want, not a lot of like pops and things like that. These lures are designed to do that for you when you're steadily retrieving. It's not like soft plastic finesse work with like bass um, where you are the one that's working the lure. These lures work for you. Um, they're designed that way. So just a slow, slow, steady retrieve. Um, and that's going to yield the, the best bites, the most results, um, the most hookups. And like I said, the smaller that that lure can be, the better off you're going to be. Um, okay, I think that we got your question answered there. Yeah, your trout are stock, but they're wild and native here. Um, so we're going to move on to bottom fishing. Um, now, bottom fishing, this is the one that I've personally seen in Oklahoma that I think people struggle with. Um the most what is the best technique for fishing for trout at the lake it's going to be the t subject matter we're going to talk talk about right now bob um bottom fishing so bottom fishing uh is taking your line so we'll do we'll do a little mock run up right here of what that looks like so we'll clip off this rooster tail here and we'll do a basic setup for trout fishing now this is going to be a this will be effective in moving water as well but this is this is your best bet for catching a lot of fish at a lake um, like a Watonga, Sunset, Perry Triple C. There's lots of shallow areas. Those fish typically don't spread out a whole lot from where they're stocked at. So from wherever the boat ramp is, they're going to use the shoreline to find cover. And then they're going to they're going to try to feed in those shallow bays, especially as the water cools off. So what we're going to do and there's two different ways to do this. So we'll try this both ways. Um, when we have a snell hook, so this is a little tiny hook. You can see that next to my finger now. You don't want to be much bigger than that. Like I said, trout have very small mouths. The smaller the hook, the better. Little snell hook already comes tied. It's got a little loop on it. It's about eight inches that you have right here. So there's two ways to do this when you're floating off the bottom because, and now this is more effective with power bait than anything else. Um, power bait is a floatant. So if you've ever discarded power bait or anything in the water, you'll see that it floats back up to the surface. Um, this hook weighs nothing. So power bait around it, it actually causes it to float up like this. Now, if you're using corn, if you're using worms, if you're using some type of dough bait or something like that, that doesn't have buoyancy, you're going to have a harder time catching trout because trout are not typically going to go grab things off the bottom. Um, it's the way they're designed, the way they're built. You know, they they evolved in their structure to 
you know, eat bugs. Um, they're constantly, now the bigger fish can get, it'll become carnivorous and it'll start to target bait fish, but primarily trout's life cycles, no matter where they live, um, they're looking for bugs. So whether that be terrestrials in the summer, we obviously don't have a whole lot of that um, outside of our two year round fisheries, but they're primarily focused, especially in Oklahoma on mayfly hatches. So, um, you know, smaller hook, things like that, but you want it off the bottom because those fish are probably, they won't sit right on the bottom. You know, they'll come down for food, but it can't, if it's sitting on the bottom, they won't go dig into the dirt like a bass will or a sunfish will or, um, or a catfish will. They, won't, they just, that's not how they feed. Um, they're looking for stuff that's either tumbling in current or they're looking for things that are emerging, coming up or falling down. So their eye line is usually looking up. Um, but they do rely on scent as well. So that's why power bait is effective. Um, personally, I prefer uh, purple nymph is the power bait flavor, but any, I don't know what they're called anymore. I mean, you have the corn scent flavor. Uh, there's a red, white, and blue one. It used to be called Captain America. I'm not sure what it's called anymore. And then you have like the rainbow sparkle, which is a green, orange, yellow with flake mixed into it. They're all effective. I, I really don't think that there's a huge difference. It's just kind of personal preference, but I tend to go with the, with the nymph flavored one. It's, it's a purple color and it's got a black flake in it. And it seems to be pretty effective at um, any of our still water fisheries that are seasonal trout. So we'll go ahead and we'll rig this up. So like I said, there's two ways to do this. Um, both are effective. It's really just uh, a preference of the angler. So what we're going to do first is we have, we have a snap swivel. So it's not a barrel swivel. It's got that snap on the end of it. So what we'll do is we'll tie on the end. Um, you know, you go with your snap swivel, you're going to go through that top eyelid. You run that through. These eyelids are big enough. A Palomar knot works the quickest, but you can tie an improved clinch or whatever knot you want. Um, you know, but use a good fishing knot. Don't tie just a simple overhand knot. It'll break. Um, so we got that on. I'm not going to cut Normally you would, you know, go trim that tag end off right there and clip it. But for time, we'll leave that on there. Uh, open up your snap swivel. And then depending on uh, how much flow or current there is, because even in still bodies of water, you're going to have a little bit of, of current. Um, you know, you're going to have a dam. You're going to have inflow into a body of water. So there's always going to be a little bit of movement. And then if the wind is blowing, that's also going to affect that. So this right here is an eighth ounce. Um, little egg sinker. I, again, as light as you can possibly go. So you could go all the way down to like a 32nd ounce little weight. Um, you really just kind of have to have a feel for the day. How fast is the water moving? If you're on still water, is the wind pushing it? Um, you want just enough tension that when you reel up your slack, when you've cast it to your spot, that the tip of the line on that rod is just, you know, just enough to bend it a little bit. Um, and if you can do that with like a 16th ounce weight or a 32nd ounce weight, that's better. Because um, again, like I said, trout peck. And if you have a heavier sinker on there, they're going to feel that, you know, resistance as they're pecking at that power bait and it might turn them off to it. But anyways, so we're going to take our weight and we're going to slide it on the uh, snap swivel here put that on. Then we're going to take our snow hook that has the nice little loop pre-tied on there for us. You slip that on, close this. Now you're good to go. So now all we have left is our hook. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to reach into my little power bait tube right here and uh, get a dab out. So it's going to come out like that on your finger when you pull it out. What you want to do, do you do not want to overkill your hook. Because like I said, trout peck, they peck, they peck. You basically want to create a teardrop or a circular shape around this hook with your power bait that just is enough to cover the hook. If you put too much on there, they're going to peck it to death and eventually it'll actually come away from the hook shank and it'll just fall off. Um, so you want just enough that they cannot feel that hook when they're biting. Again, trout have very sensitive mouths when they're biting on it. It's not like a catfish or a bass that are used to eating crawfish and other things that have points and spikes that they can handle that. When trout go and eat something, if it's pokey or it's sharp, 
they'll turn away from it pretty quickly. So you're just going to work that on the hook to something like that. And that even right there, it might be just a little bit too much power bait, but if the bite's really on, you get lots of opportunities to figure it out. But so essentially what happens is we have it like this. So when you cast out to your spot, that weight is going to sink down. It's going to sit right here on the bottom. And this is actually, because it's buoyant, it's going to float back up. So this is what it would look like if it was underwater. Your weight would be on the bottom and this was that would actually be floating. So when that fish comes over and it's pecking at it, what that's doing is it's moving your weight a little bit on the bottom. And so what you'll see when a trout bites is a lot of this. You'll see a lot of jumpy and you'll want to run and grab that rod and set the hook. You're going to pull it right out of its mouth. This is the only part of this type of fishing that becomes a little bit difficult is judging the exact time that you need to set the hook because it lots of swings and misses, lots of trial and error. There's really no perfect scenario. Um, you hope that that trout has just got it in its mouth. Um, anytime you feel any type of steady tension on the line, like if it's moving like that, hammer down that hook set, just like a bass, drill that thing in. Um, if you're going out to the lake and you just want to catch a lot of fish, but you're not necessarily keen on taking them home, set that hook the second that you know that the fish has got it. Um, you want to hook that fish right through the top lip or right in the tongue patch, anything like that. If you give them too much time on this, eventually they will inhale it. It'll hit the back of their throat. That fish will die. Um, they make, uh, they look like little red plastic toy guns. That's a hook removal. It can work, but if you have a barbed hook on, trout are very, very fickle fish. They die, you know, from lots and lots and lots of things. Um, poor handling techniques, um, anything like that. But if that hook goes back to where their gill plate is at, if it gets beyond that, the mortality rate is, is through the roof. So you're going to try to return that fish and it's going to float over on its belly and it's going to come right up. So if you're going to use bait, and you, but you also want to catch and release, do that, set that hook as early as possible once you know it's there. Otherwise, if you're just looking to keep your fish, if you're just going out there to uh, catch and take, then give them all the time in the world. Let them swallow that hook. Because once they get it back there, there's very little chance of you actually losing the fish when it's coming in, even a big one. Um, most of our bodies of water. watonga has got some structure that's in there where you might snap your line on something else. But most of our bodies of water that have trout in it, you're going to bring them straight in without a lot of structure that could potentially nick your line. So if you're wanting to keep the fish, then by all means, let them peck at it for a while and you'll know when they've got it back in their gullet and that line starts to, you know, run away from you. Um, thoughts on using a bubble float. Uh, Tyler, are you talking about using bait with a bubble float or are you talking about um, fly fishing, like with an indicator? Uh, if you use a float like a bobber or anything to fish, like if let's say instead of this weight right here, we had a bobber on it, you would need to put a piece of split shot on just to get the power bait down. But like I said, trout are the, they have a tendency to peck at the bait instead of just engulfing it um, in one shot. So what's going to end up happening if you're using a flotation, you don't have any of that tension. So you might see your float going up and down as they're trying to peck at it the opportunity to try to go and set that hook, you know, the best opportunity you would have to fish with a float with bait is going to be a stick bobber, you know, something very, very slender, not a round bobber. You want something that if they do grab it, that thing goes right under. So you know when to set the hook, but typically if you're using bait for trout, you want to be from the bottom. Um, it's just going to be a lot more difficult to set that hook. And again, you know, how far you want to go below your float. Uh, again, trout are going to hang out right off of the bottom. You know, they're going to be anywhere from a foot to three feet off the bottom, you know, searching and they work shorelines pretty heavily. Trout move a lot throughout the course of a day. Um, whereas your warm water species like bass and sunfish and crappie, they might just find a particular spot for the morning, not move very far for the afternoon and then come right back to where they were for the evening. A trout on the other hand, may they may swim a shoreline all the way around the lake looking for food. So 
like most salmonoid species that, um, you know, their DNA was ingrained in rivers. And a lot of those fish, like with rainbow trout, their Andromenus, you know, cousin is the steelhead and those fish go out to the ocean and they come back. So those fish have more of a tendency to move throughout the course of the day. So you'll get big schools of fish that will come through. You'll get a big bite around like 10 a.m. And then it'll get really quiet for an hour. And then you'll roll back around to one o'clock. And it's not so much that the fish are right there and they're just not biting. You're just not on the fish anymore. You know, they've moved around a point and they've circled back and they're looking for food and then they'll come back. Whereas if you're fishing for your warm water species, they might be right there. You might have the bait right in front of them and they're just not willing to bite. Trout tend to move a lot more. So being based on the bottom as opposed to a float, um, it just makes it makes it a little bit easier. Um, and we're all about success here. Uh, I'm the type of angler where I love catching big fish, but if it's quantity over quality, I'm taking quantity any day of the week. I hate not catching fish more than I like catching fish. So uh, if I 30, 40, 50 trout at a lake in four, you know, three, four hours, because I know the power bait bites on, or I know they're really working a couple of coves or something like that. I want to go out there and just catch as many fish as possible. So um, most of the stuff I'm covering right here is stuff that's tried and true. It's effective. I know it works. Um, and, uh, I want you guys to be successful. I want you to, you know, have some takeaways from this and maybe learn something new. So that's kind of our basic setup on this. Now we're going to go do the other option that you have. If you do not want to use a snap swivel, and this will actually allow you to adjust, um, your depth off the bottom. Cause obviously we're, we're restricted here with the swivel. We got eight inches. That's all we got. We're, we're not getting any higher up in the water column. Now, if you feel like maybe fish are three, four feet up and they're just not coming down to your bait, you can do the same exact setup, but without a uh, swivel. So we're going to pull this off, cut that line. Um, take this off of our snap swivel. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do this as far as when we get to attaching the snell hook back. But basically what you're going to do is you'll run the end of your line. So we got the tag end of our main Time line. To stretch. And Go so we're, we're going to pull right. this. We're going to pull this right through the eyelid on the top right here. And then we're going to take a piece of split shot and we're going to use the split shot in place of where the swivel would have been. So let's say you want to be like two feet off the bottom or 18 inches off the bottom. So I'm going to pull, I'm going to pull this eight or I'm going to pull the egg 18 inches up the line. Then I'm going to take the piece of split shot and we're going to put it down line of the egg weight. So towards the tag end. So tag ends over here, you want your split shot below your egg weight. Now, when you're fishing like this, if you're going to do this, and this is kind of how I grew up fishing, I didn't start using a snap swivel until I got older and lazier and wanted a quicker way to get on. Um, use pliers. Don't use your teeth to clamp these to the line. Um, split shot have a tendency to move up and down line. Um, so you really want to get that thing on there good. So take a pair of pliers and really, you know, just double hand that thing and make sure that that will not move up and down the line. Like if I pull as hard as I can, I can move it a little bit, but I know that it being bouncing on the bottom and things like that, it's not going to go anywhere. So it does the same exact thing that swivel did, except now we have line to deal with. So there's a couple of ways that you can do this. Um, it's really kind of angler preference of how you're going to tie back on uh, to the snail hook. So now we have this loop to contend with, right? Well, you could just take a very small hook. Like, you know, you can buy a hook that is similar in shape and size to these snail hooks. That's probably your best bet. Um, but if you like just the prepackaged snail hooks where they're easy to keep, um, you have a couple of different options. You can either just do, uh, you can tie an improved clinch to the end of it. So you would just go up. And then an improved clinch is spin it, spin the line five or six times, go through the little loop that you made, not through the snail hook loop, but the one on the main line. 
And then obviously you double back through your loop and there's your improved clinch. And then you would cinch that tight. Uh, another option is you can do a Palomar through it, um, which Palomar is just doubling over our line right here, create a loop and you would go through and then you would create your knot or your overhand loop. And now you have a new loop and then you would grab the end of this and bring it back through your loop. And then that would attach a Palomar to it. But taking some fly fishing principles here of the best way to keep your line on there, take the tag end of your line, your main line, tie an overhand, double it over like this, and just tie a basic overhand knot with that. So on that main line, all we're doing is we're doubling it over, right? So we're creating our own loop. So now our, our end now looks like the end of the snow hook. If anybody here is a fly angler, they know this is how you attach your leader to your fly line. So all you're doing with this is you can thread it through. Oops. You thread that through and then you bring it down and go around that line and then pull it tight. That's the most effective way to do it. That's the, that's going to create the strongest knot because you haven't actually tied a knot on to the end of the snow loop, which if you tie a Palomar or an improved clinch, there's going to be some tension problems at some point, but that way you do that, pull that sucker tight. Good to go. Like, so those are your two options. And now if we want our, uh, you know, so I'm probably two feet above, so I want to adjust this a little bit. Um, you know, now, now I'm out of frame. So when I was using the eight inch snell hook, I didn't have a whole lot of weight from the bottom. Um, but now our hook, you can adjust. So that's, that's the easiest way to adjust your bottom fishing while still using a snell hook. And I encourage people to use these. They are designed for trout. They're designed to catch trout. Um, they're built in a very specific way, the way the hook is shaped. Um, and that knot that they have on there, that snell knot, you know, you're not losing fish with this. This is, this is more than likely the equivalent of about 12 pound test on that line. And you're attaching to actually smaller line than it. So, uh, snell hooks are, are the way to go as opposed to just tying on a little bait holding hook at the end of your line. So that kind of covers our bait bottom fishing portion of the course. Um, take a look over here. Um, don't see any questions. If anybody's got any questions, like I said, pop them into the chat bar. We'll try to address them as we're going along. Um, and then when we get to the end of the course, we'll just open it open ended, and then you can ask whatever question you want. Um, so move this back over here. So this brings us to the fly fishing portion of our trout course here. Um, and then just a quick recap on, on where we're at. So we've gone over our spinning reel setups and this is all I had. So we got, I got three boxes. If I'm, if I plan on going out and I'm going to be a spin, that's all I'm doing. I'm not fly fishing. I don't plan on power bait fishing. I just want to cast and retrieve, which is primarily what I do. If I'm not fly fishing, I, I don't do a whole lot of power bait fishing. Sometimes it's really effective and uh, I'll take family and friends and it, it's a great way to relax because you're fishing in a stationary position, sitting in a lawn chair, you can hang out. Um, it's not labor intensive. So I want to consolidate what I take. So I got my three boxes here that have everything that I would even potentially use for trout. And like I said, outside of the couple of super dupers that I showed earlier, I'm not venturing very far away from a box that looks like that rooster tails some tubes some super dupers and maybe a couple of little cleo spoons um everything that's in this box has kind of been a random assortment of stuff i've collected over the years um that have come in you know different types of packages and with different things and you know you got you got different types of rooster tails and inline spinners and then these are 
some of these spoons are a little too big. These are more for like lake trout and, um, you know, big body of water fish. And then, you know, inline spinners that kind of have the fish head on it, uh, a non concave spoon, things like that. But you can pretty much get everything that you would need to be, have a successful day of trout fishing in Oklahoma on any given body of water. Um, especially in December, January, and February, you really, if you just want to be a straight cast and retrieve, uh, you know, that some super dupers and some spoons, little Cleos, it's all you need. And that will fit right in your pocket, which is great, but I don't want to take anything that does, that fills up more than a little tote bag. I want to, I want to have easy access. I don't want a backpack. I don't want a whole bunch of stuff. So being able to consolidate your fishing equipment, um, by identifying what is um, helping you have success, that's that's really going to improve your fishing experience. Um, it's going to cut down on clutter and um, being organized. You're just going to probably have a better day on the water. So, and then from my power bait, power bait's even easier. So I'll put these back in. But our little snail hooks. This is all I have for uh, for my bait fishing. Just this. Just this box and a can, you know, deal power bait. This one, uh, these are actually, oops, these are actually crappie nibbles, but you know, you can mush them together and make power bait. But you go to Bass Pro or Cabela's, or uh, if you live in areas that have trout fishing around it, they're going to have all of your your normal power bait, which is you know one solid jar, and you're just scooping your finger in and pulling out a little dab of it. But worst case scenario, you get crappie nibbles and they mush together. You know, we had we had a whole bunch of different pieces. It doesn't take very much to turn it into that and it'll work right around a hook. So, um, but that's it. That's, you know, complete consolidation. So if I'm taking spinning equipment anywhere, you know, I, I only have four boxes with me. I have my cast and retrieve and then the power bait deal. Throw it into a tote bag, no bigger than that, and a rod. That's it. Super simplistic great for kids um it's great for you know uh intermediate novice anglers who are just looking to get out and do some fishing in the winter where you know they might otherwise think fishing is not very good for your warm water species so that covers our uh artificial portion that is not fly fish. so now we're going to get into the fly fish and this is really kind of near and dear to my heart i am originally from seattle washington uh, that's where I spent the first 22 years of my life. So my introduction to fishing, um, my, you know, re real first experiences before I became more of the angler that I am today, where I, you know, I, I'll jug line, um, you know, I'll catfish, got really big into bass and crappie and other sunfish species, walleye, sawguy, things like that. But before I ever started adventuring out, um, I spent my adolescent, teen, and young 20s fly fishing. That was pretty much all I did. So um, while the rivers and streams of the Pacific Northwest and Montana and things like that, that I, I grew up fishing or I spent, you know, that was, that was my introduction to trout. Uh, it's a little bit different here, but it's the same principles. Um, we're, it's actually a little bit easier um, to be honest, because you're not trying to match the hatch. Uh, fish are a lot more reactionary here, so they may not be as keyed in on the bugs you're using. So we're really looking more for pattern than we are for actual, like, identical match to a bug. Because a wild or a native fish is going to be able to pick those out all day long. Um, in Oklahoma, again, even the fish that are year-round in the lower Illinois and lower Mountain Fork, you know, outside of very, very sporadic, potential for reproduction on the lower mountain fork where there may be a couple of wild fish. And again, they have to survive the gauntlet of being born and um, having a bunch of trout around them, as well as some warm water species like walleye, white bass and uh, smallmouth bass and largemouth bass that are in the lower mountain fork. The odds of a wild born uh, trout on the lower hill and, or the lower mountain fork getting to adulthood is very slim. So, you know, the genetics of those fish are not going to evolve to the point where they are keyed in like a native or a wild fish would be in that river system. Um, but they have tons of time. It's year round. So they eventually adapt to, you know, they learn what's around them. They learn what to eat. They know what's in that river system. Um, but it's easier to target them 
aside from the pressure that they would get. Um, these are obviously public areas that aren't very big. Um, lower Mount or the lower mountain fork. I think you have seven, seven miles, seven, eight miles. Same thing with blue river, lower Illinois is even less. So you, you get heavy, heavy f- fishing pressure. Um, guys and, you know, anglers are throwing a lot of the same things. So th- those fish get educated, but they're a lot easier to trick. So we're going to go through the basic patterns for fly fishing. Um, like I said, for your, um, oh, I should have mentioned for the bait portion, if you're fishing off the bottom, instead of using the micro light rods, because they're a little bit harder to set the hook on, it's easier when you have a moving bait because the, you know, that treble hook or that single hook is in motion. So that's doing a lot of the hook set for you. Uh, if you're using bait off the bottom, you probably want to favor a, a stiffer rod, like a six and a half foot, seven foot rod that's like medium to medium light action you don't want to use a micro light you're going to have a hard time pulling with that weight and the tension from the line and then the water current as well as the fish you want a little bit sturdier top end of the rod to be able to set the hook Um, but for fly fishing lots of different options uh, in Oklahoma you really don't need to get more than a six weight so right here I have a nine foot six weight with a Ross reel on it for a six weight that's got floating line. So that's your basic setup. Five or six weight is perfect, but three and four weight work equally as well. It's all up to the angler. What do you like to use? I enjoy fishing more micro rods and reels for bigger fish. Um, So I usually favor a three weight if I'm going out. Um, Same thing, like if I'm doing cast and retrieve, I'm going to favor more of a micro light rod just because you know, you get more tension. It's a little bit more difficult to get the fish in. I typically, even in areas where I'm allowed to have a barbed hook with a rooster tail, I'll usually clip the barbs, make it a little bit more competitive for those fish because I don't personally keep them. Um, so I want them to live. So I'll try to play a fair game with them. Um, but anyways, so got our two-piece rod. Don't have quite enough room in here between ceiling for my nine-foot rod to, to strap it up. But this is a four-piece rod. Um most basic setups for a five weight that you can buy like Reddington's and uh, white river, your very basic models. If you're looking to get into fly fishing, they're going to be two piece rods, um, probably somewhere in the eight to nine foot range. Um, but anyways, we'll start from the, we'll start from the beginning as far as rigging up for people. Um, so your fly line is obviously a lot different than your spinning reel, your bait casting reel, your spin casting reel. It spins both ways. You can set a drag on it. Um, your drag is right here. And that's going to be, if you actually get the fish on the reel, if it starts to run, you know, instead of letting the spool go and let it go like that, if you have tension on it, you have your drag set, you can actually fight the fish just like you would with, um, you know, more traditional gear. Um, so getting your fly line off of your reel to start, you want to find the very end of where that leader line is at, which sometimes can be difficult. They like to bury in there sometimes. So we'll get this out here in a second. Sometimes if you just spin it a couple of times, it'll actually help you pull that out. So what I have attached to my fly line here is just a nine foot 4X leader. Um, If you're not familiar with fly fishing, the classification of weight like online. So if you're, if you're a typical you know, bait caster, spin casting, spin, spinning reel person, and you're going to buy a line, it'll say four pound test, eight pound test, six pound test, 12 pound test, fly line or a leaders and tippet doesn't typically say that. So you're going to have increments of like six X, five X, four X, three X, two X, one X, zero X. And then you're going to get into really, really heavy stuff for like salt water where it's not even going to, it'll tell you this is 30 pound um, tippet or uh, for a leader. So, Oklahoma, you really don't need more than a nine foot leader and your leader starts right here and it attaches to your fly line. Um, This has floating line on it. There's a few different options for the actual fly line. You could have sink tip line, um, intermediate line, things like that. You really don't need more than floating line in Oklahoma, whether you're fishing in a lake or you're fishing in a river because you can use split shot if you're on a lake, if you're, let's say you're in a float tube and you're trolling, you know, you're, you're paddling and you have like a woolly bugger or something on that you're just trying to move through the water split shot. We'll get it down to where you need to get it. So anyways, 
So we'll put our nine foot 4X leader. So what 4X is, is 4X is going to be about um, six pound test. So we have, we got, we get to the end of our leader, right? Well, you don't want to tie directly onto this leader because leaders are tapered. So it's really hard to see on the screen, but we have our line right here and it's a pretty thick. So I'm going to pull it through and you're going to see the diameter of that line start to shrink. It's going to start to get a little bit harder to see. And it's tapered all the way down until we get to the end. So what you want to attach to the end of your leader is going to be um, your tippet. So typically for tippet, you want to either tie on the equal of what your leader is. So this is 4X. I don't want to tie anything on heavier than 4X. So typically you're going to size down one size for your tippet or it's going to be equal to. So um, 5X tippet right here, this is the equivalent of six pound test. Our 4X leader, the equivalent of 6.4 pound test. So not really a huge difference between 4 and 5X. Um, leaders come in lots of different sizes. They usually come in a pack like this. Th these are nine foot three X. So it, it says right here, it's eight pound test. So your three X is about eight pound test. Um, so we'll take, we'll do this in an easy way. Um, we'll, we'll just do line to line. But part of the reason why fly lines are tapered is you're not casting weight out, right? You're actually using the line to gain line while you're casting. So you're pulling it off of your reel and you're using the tension on the tip of the fly rod to get your line to get farther out, back and forth. It's going equal distances behind you as it is going in front of you. And the reason that it's tapered is it creates more of an aerodynamic line where when that fly's tied on, it unravels. So it, cre it looks like this. It's like a real tight lasso where your line's coming, it's going back, and when it comes through, it'll create, if my arm right here up to here creates a very quintessential loop like this as it unravels diameter and the same weight, it wouldn't have that type of aerodynamics. So tying on to the end of your leader is very important that you don't tie on heavier tippet. Now, if you want, if you're targeting really big fish um, outside of trout, or if you go somewhere in the country where they do have, you know, wild or native, really big trout um, that, that you want to throw a really, really small fly to, but you also, you want to uh, kind of galvanize your, your line, you might cut the leader up higher up. You might cut a lot of that tag off and tie on zero X for two feet and then tie on two X for two feet and then 3x for a foot, and then, you know, 4x, 5x. So the smaller, or the higher the x goes, like 5, 6, 7, 8, the actual, the lighter the line is getting. Um, because flies, as we will show you here in a second, the eye holes for some of the flies as we get into sizes like 20, 22, 24, I mean, you're talking about bugs that are that big that have an eyelid or an eye hole on them that can just barely fit the diameter of that line through the actual eyelid. So, um, but really, really big fish will eat some of the smallest little bugs that you can see. So tapering down your line to get to that. You don't have to worry about that in Oklahoma. Um, you're just a basic nine foot leader, four X or five X, maybe even three X. Um, and then taking your corresponding tippet and tippet's great because it, the way that it's sold on these deals, they actually attach to each other. So you can have all your different sizes of your tippet and then they can pull right off. But it's a great way they have their they have the little stopper gaps on them. So your line is just always readily available to you, which is nice. So, so we want to take on our in Oklahoma, but we're just going to do this very generic. Um, your basic fly line setup is going to be probably three, three to four feet of tippet. So you're going to pull out three or four feet still attached to this. Um, and so the, the diameter of these two lines is identical. They're both 4X. So that makes it pretty easy. Um, we're gonna tie a blood knot on 
and blood knots get harder to tie the different the diameter sizes are between the two pieces of line. So if you're trying to tie zero X to six X, um, you're, you're not going to create an equal bond between the two parts on the blood knot. I'll show you what I'm talking about in a second. Um, but to tie your blood knot, so we have our two pieces of line right here. Um, this is, here's my fly line, here's my tippet line. These are, again, equal diameters. So we're going to go, we're going to create an X. I'm going to try to show this. These lines are really small. Maybe my hat will give some uh, contrast. But anyways, you want to run them back or by each other, just like this. So you're going to hold your two fingers together. It's going to create a V. And you maybe want to go, you know, that's probably about four inches, three, four inches. Enough tag line that you can hold. So I pinched the two pieces of line together like this. So we're going to grab one tag end. This tag end is from the tippet that's going this way. It's going to go up the fly line. What you're going to do is you're going to take it and we're going to wrap it around the leader line four or five times. And then you're going to take the it. So now we have a nice little braided section right here, right? So we're going to pull it up. And we're going to pinch it where the leader or the tippet line where we had our V. So you want to put that thing right between that V. It's going to hold right in that little crease right there. So now we just have our leader end. We pull it through the V and we're going to do the exact opposite. We're going to, Twist this around the line in the opposite rotation down the tippet line four or five times. Now, you want to do an equal amount so that your blood knot is symmetrical. Um, and then I'll show you what I was talking about when you're trying to get different size diameters. So this has created a loop right here. Really hard to see in this light, but we're going to run that second tag end. We're going to run it through this little tiny hole or loop that we've created and it's gonna create two loops off of those main lines. So it's gonna look like that, right? So those tag ends are going in opposite directions. So you're gonna wet your line. You're gonna hold on to those tag ends. It's really easy. It's kind of hard to do it unless you have really big hands, like long fingers, to take just one of the tag ends off and just pinch it off like between your front teeth. Cause you just, all you need is the tension on the line but you want those pieces going in opposite directions. And we're just gonna pull the line away from each other and see how that knot cinches up like that. And that's our blood knot. So now we've connected two pieces of line with a symmetrical knot. So it has equal parts on both sides because it's forming essentially a wrap is the knot on both sides and then it's cinching down. So you don't want one side overwhelming the other and because these are equal portions, that knot looks just like a little B. Now, if we tied 5X on to 4X, one side would just be slightly smaller. Um, but again, if you're skipping huge steps, if you're, tying, if you're trying to tie on 6X to 2X, one side of that knot is going to be, you know, it's going to be thicker in diameter than the other half of the knot. And that's just going to cause you problems. You know, you're going to get it's not going to create that nice aerodynamic of the dynam or the diameter of the line tapering down. Um, and again, it's also not, you don't want to have too much tippet off. Like, so all your tippet is, your tippet is chew line. Um, you're using this so that you can tie on multiple, multiple bucks. Um, so you can switch out, but you don't want to cut into your leader because your leader came in a package. It's, it's one length. It's nine feet. It's not getting any longer. So if you start chewing up that, then you're increasing the diameter of the line each cut you make into that. So what Tippet is doing is saving you from having to start cutting up your leader where that diameter starts to get heavier. Um, and then you can no longer fit the tag end of the line through uh, your fly eyelid, especially the smaller you get. Um, so if with that, we've just created our chew line. Um, and again, sometimes you're wanting to taper it. You're wanting to get that extra distance. Uh, if fish are being really finicky or they're sight, you know, you can sight fish for them. You know, you might want to tie on a 12 foot leader and then three feet, you know, two to three feet of 
the size down of line, um, you know, to, to hide that line from the fish. Because obviously the floating line is colored. Um, they can see that when it's floating. Uh, they typically make fly lines and in colors that are better in the spectrum. So it's harder for fish to see, but they can see it. So the smaller your diameter and line gets, when that little bug is attached to the end of it, you're trying to mimic a natural, you know, movement of a, of a bug, whether it be a nymph in the water or it, you know, it be some type of a merger or spinner or just a basic dry fly. Um, so typically I would go, I go about two feet with your leader. Um, this is probably going to, depending on how, how good you are at conserving line when you tie on, if you don't have a long tag end, if you can do it with a, you know, a fairly short tag end to tie your bug on this to right here, this chew line, that's probably going to get you, you know, five or six bugs that you can tie on that you'll, you know, detach and lose some line until you get back to your blood knot. Um, but again, it's very important that when you buy a new leader and you put it on your fly line, before you tie a bug on, you get tippet on the end. Um, because every time that you wear your chew, chew line down back to the knot, then you have to cut above the knot. So then you're cutting into your leader again, and you're going to have to burn about that much leader. And you can only do that once or twice. Once you get to about here, you get about eight inches eight to 12 inches from the end of that leader. Now we're into that heavy diameter. It's not going to cast well. It's going to be difficult to try to tie your blood knot onto. Um, and leaders aren't meant to last forever. I mean, that's why they come in three packs like this, but you want to get the most bang for your buck. So being able to tie on something like that. So that kind of covers our setup. One more little uh, for people who don't fly fish and you're just, you're interested in the subject matter and kind of how it works. Um, Cause it's very much different than your, you know, your typical spinning and spin casting and, and bait casting. It's an entirely different setup. So when you go to string your line, just like a normal, uh, you know, spinning rod or bait casting rod, you have eyelids. You have eyelids all the way up the rod deck until you get to the rod tip. But unlike how you would go and put your typical monofilament, fluorocarbon or braided line through your eyelids where you're grabbing the tag in. So I'm going to go ahead and cut the end of this off. Perfect. So instead of taking your tag in and running it through the eyelids like this painstakingly up your nine foot rod, where if you, the wind blows or you lose it, it all comes falling back through. You're actually going to pull your leader line until you get to your fly line like this. So we're at our fly line. I'm going to pull maybe two or three feet past that. Then I'm going to double over the fly line like this. And I'm going to pull the line off the reel and then you thread it through like this. That way, you know, now I can pull that loose end that I've created and I got my rope to go through. And it's a lot easier to do that all the way through. And then when you get to the top, this is obviously not the top. This is the bottom half of the rod, but for, for my ceiling's sake, we'll just pull it. Then when you get to the top, you just pull all your line through. So now we're through. Perfect. Easy way to rig it up real quick. So now let's start talking about the fun part, bugs. Um, you, if you are a fly angler or maybe you've, you know, you've dabbled a little bit or you've done some reading or you watch some shows, you hear match the hatch, match the hatch, match the hatch. Absolutely true in most parts. Oklahoma, not quite as important, but it's in, it is important to understand those principles, why, you know, why that terminology is used, what you're actually trying to replicate. Like I said, your wintertime months in Oklahoma for trout fishing, and that's what we're talking about right now. We could have an entirely different course on fishing our two uh, year round trout fisheries during the spring, summer and fall, because those fisheries change quite a bit throughout the year, like a, a normal stream would um, for a cold water species. So we're just talking about wintertime trout in Oklahoma. So we have mayflies and we have midges and your mayfly hatch. So they're, you, we can go down the road of entomology and all the different types and, you know, um, you know, different, different variations of bugs. But typically what you're going to see in Oklahoma from your mayfly hatch, they're going to be, um, you know, if you're looking for a bug, when you go to a fly shop, it's going to be a blue wing olive. So, and a lot of times that's abbreviated. So it's BWO. You're going to see that. Um, 
your mayflies in the winter months are going to typically um, be more of like an olive color. That's why, again, like I said, with the browns and the olives for your inline spinners and things like that, that's why they're effective. While they're clearly not mimicking what a bug would be doing, a mayfly as it's trying to hatch, in that fish's mind, it's, you know, it's recognizing those color schemes and those color schemes ultimately become important. Um, if for some reason you ever see fish rising in Oklahoma, um, trout rising, they're more than likely going after emerging mayflies or emerging midges. So what we're looking at for that, I have a bunch of different fly boxes here. Um, you know, a fly box might look something like that, might look something like that. Uh, we have a double-sided one where we've got some streamers and, and some other bugs. But we'll start, we'll start from the bottom and work our way to the surface. So there's two different types, well, there's actually three different types of fly fishing that are effective in Oklahoma. You're going to have your dry fly fishing, which you can have a really good hatch some days. Um, it shouldn't be expected when you show up, but if the temperature's right, if uh, the baromic barometric pressure is right. A lot of conditions can come together where you can really tear up fish on dry flies, which is awesome. I mean, top water fishing is most anglers, you know, their favorite thing. It's, it's visually stimulating. You get to see the fish actually come up and take it. So it's exciting. Um, get your heart racing. That's usually the most fun fishing. So uh, you have your dry fly, you have nymph fishing, and then you have strip fishing, which is casting out a streamer or some type of jigged um, jigged fly, which is mimicking a bait fish or some type of crustacean or something like that. And what that is, is you're casting out into current, typically up river, allowing the main part of the current to come through on your line. In fly fishing, typically you don't want to have any bend in your line. You want to have a kind of a men free deal where where your fly is to where your rod tip is it's a pretty straight line that's going to give you the most natural drift free float uh strip fishing is the exact opposite you want a big bow in your line downstream because you want that water doing the work for you which is going to swing that streamer across you know a main feeding point you're going to work that in between boulders you're going to work micro seams anything like that you're going to swing that fly through and it does most of the work for you well, when it gets all the way down to the end where now you're straight to it, right before it finishes the bow and the line, where now the line straight back to you, that's when you're making quick strip bursts. So if I was on the fly rod and I have my line out and I'm trying to, I'm at the very end of that drift, we're making real short bursts like this. And all that's doing is moving that fly like this across. It's kind of like a jerk bait um, for if you're bass fishing, if that's what it's going to mimic the most, at least in style. It's kind of these erratic, quick, dark. But when it's in the current, it's actually doing the work for you. So you can give it a little burst every speed every now and then, but it's swinging out. And typically those fish grab that fly right as it hits the swing, which is perfect because it lines up with a good loaded hook set. You don't have to worry about slacking the line. You really, you know, you're on that fish. And again, another pretty typical fly saying is tug is the drug. Once you start hooking fish, swinging flies, especially bigger fish, steelhead, smallmouth bass, um, things like that, there's nothing like having that fly come down and just be hammered at the end because your line's already there. So it's super easy hook set. Um, so there's a couple of different options that you have. The most typical streamer in fly fishing, um, which is pretty universal, is going to be your clouds or minnow. Um, your clouds or minnows are going to look something like that. You're going to see these at any basic fly shop. Um, and by basic, I mean not ma and pa, not where you're on the river, where they're really, you know, you might have some local fly tires, but your big box factory, your Cabela's, your Bass Pro. So Bass Pro, their fly shop, you know, it's White River. Um, but these are very mass produced clouds or minnows. They're effective in saltwater for salmon species. They're effective in the Caribbean for, um, you know, warm water salt species, they're effective for trout. I typically stay away from clouds or minnows. Um, in Oklahoma, I'm looking more for a woolly bugger, something like this that I can swing. Again, we have our color scheme down here on the bottom. That's very, these are just beadhead woolly buggers. And as you can see, my color pattern right here is almost identical to what I had in my, um, 
in my inline spinner mugs. So you can see kind of that color transition of those woolly buggers down on the bottom. Again, that's just, those are your most effective colors. You can't get away from it. Um, so tying something, tying something like that on, that's real good. I don't like a whole lot of flash to it. These other ones that are in here, you know, they got more of that sparkle to them. Uh, it, that's again, just angler preference. Is there really that big of a difference? I don't know, but you know, I, you try to be more natural, a little less flash. If you can get them with something that's just got a very light flash in it, that's kind of olive like that. Um, these are very effective um, at Blue River. They're going to be very effective at Medicine Creek. They're probably going to be effective at Robbers Cave. Um, and they're going to be effective on lakes. But again, if you're fly fishing a lake uh, in Oklahoma and you are not targeting a particular hatch that's happening fairly near to shore, the best way to fly fish lakes in Oklahoma is to troll. So if you were in a float tube um, or a pedal kayak, if you can, if you don't have to use a paddle, all you're doing is you're, you know, you're casting out as much line as you can get out, but you don't really have to worry because you can start kicking and just thread line out. And you're going to let that thing sink down in the water column. And if you're in a float tube, you can just lightly kick backwards. Your line is tight right in front of you. You're holding it and you know, fish will come up and hammer it. Um, that's a very effective way to do it. I, again, growing up in Seattle in the Northwest, that was a pretty popular way to fish. I don't see it um, very often in Oklahoma, people out in float tubes employing that type of technique. But if you do want to fly fish a lake and get out on it, that is, that's the best way to catch trout is a carry special, a woolly bugger in brown or olive um, on a bead head. You know, you may put one piece of split shot on it just to help you out a little bit um, to get that thing lower, especially if you're using floating line. You want to get that line down farther in the water column. And you're just going to – you basically just get parallel with a bank, and you'll be 30 feet off of the bank, and you just slowly, you know, paddle your feet, keeping maybe, you know, that trolling speed is – you know, that fly is just barely moving through the water like this, very steadily. You're not stripping it. It's just you get a certain amount of line out. Hold the line tight on the rod. So if our line's out, you're just kicking and our, your line's out in the water and you just have it like this. You're just holding that line right here because when, when you feel the fish take, your rod tip's going to bend over. Um, but you'll just, you can kick the entire lake, like Perry Triple C, all those little points that run along it. There's really good fishing jetties out there. It's really great public access for bank anglers. But if you do get out in the water on a float tube or a paddle kayak, get 30 feet offshore, maybe 20 feet offshore and just work parallel with the banks and just go all the way around and you'll pick up lots and lots of fish doing that. Um, and like, and we covered what you would do in a river. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, like I said, you can use clouds or minnows, but typically your uh, woolly bugger or like a carry special fly, which is, um, if you're putting a bead, it doesn't have a bead head on it, but you put a piece of split shot. Um, those come in a color scheme that is, is pretty generic for a trout. So it has a lot of success rate. Um, you can also really get fancy or a little bit more involved. These are jig headed flies. Um, my buddy in Montana ties these. These are you. He sends these all over the world. Guys use these on the Nile River for tiger fish or the Congo River for tiger fish. They use them out in the salt for bonefish and tarpon. Guys use them in Montana to catch 24 inch rainbows and 30 inch browns. But you can use these. Um, they're double jointed. Uh, this fly company is Dirty Water Fly Co. Uh, it's based out of Twin Bridges in Montana. But it's basically taking a bass hook. So this is an owner bass hook on this jig head um, and they're really hard to throw. I, they're super heavy. So you're not going to get a very pretty fly. Um, and that's kind of where you want to get that battle leader where you're tying zero X to two X to four X. And then you're probably tying on, you don't want to tie five X or six X onto this. You're probably going to break it off. Um, but again, you work these just like I said with that, uh, when you're throwing it into current and you're letting it swing and come through, but because these are double jointed, um, here off the base, it's actually kind of a dropper tail. The hook point is farther up the body. So you have this loose deal back here that swings. So just like a woolly bugger that would swing through, but it's all one piece, this thing kicks like a tail as it comes through. These are really effective if you have some carnivorous brown or rainbow trout that are looking to plug something. 
Um, but you will, you probably won't find something like this in a fly shop in Oklahoma. You know, you have to look online to, to get things like that. So that's where your, your woolly buggers, you can get those at the white river uh, deal at Bass Pro or um, any other major big box outfitters in Oklahoma that sell flies. Um, but if you really want to get into fly fishing and things like that, especially on our two year round, go into the local fly shops, talk to the people. They're, they're helpful. They want you to be successful and they're going to, they're going to help you match that hatch. They, they're tuned into what guys are fishing. I'm telling you information that I know works historically. Um, some days it's awesome. Some days it's slow, but I know that when I take all of this out there, I'm going to catch fish. Um, I'm not worried about that. As long as you're not fishing on a flood or a monsoon or just something crazy, everything we talked about today, you're going to have success. It's going to be enough to catch your limit of fish. If that's what you're looking to do, if you're looking to catch your six fish and go, Everything we've talked about here today is going to get you your six fish. Um, so let's move into nymph fishing. So nymph fishing can be done two ways. Most typically it's done with the float indicator. People who use bait casters, spinning reels, spin casting equipment, call them bobbers. Fly fishing world, bobber has a not so great connotation. So they're called strike indicators um, or a float, you know, whatever your choice is. So you can fish it with a float, which is holding, again, like I said, we have, floating fly line. So this line right here doesn't sink. So it just stays right on top of the water. Now, if you're throwing out your monofilament or your braid or your fluorocarbon, it sinks. Like if you let it sit there long enough, your line will actually sink. This floating line, it stays buoyant. It goes out there. So when we actually get to the leader of the line, your leader will sink. So depending on how your, where your strike indicator is, is relationship from bottom to water surface through a given run so in oklahoma uh and you're really not going to be nymph fishing on still water this is more for flowing water um so typically you're probably not going to have more than eight feet to the bottom in the lower mountain fork or in the lower illinois there are some deeper holes but typically you're only going to want to be about four feet below uh your strike indicator so we would have i don't have a strike indicator on me uh that i know of but um you can tie something off. Anyways, uh, we would put, you know, you you put it four feet up the line. So we have some tippet tied onto this. So I'll cut that off. Um, so there's two different ways you can go about nymphing. You can put one bug on and just use the one. Most people, when they nymph fish, they use two bugs. So you have, you have your top bug and then you're going to put on a dropper bug. So you're going to tie on tippet to the base of that hook shank and then attach it to the eyelid of the second. So there's a couple of different theories on how you can do that. Um, European fly fishing or European nymphing, uh, they're going to use a really heavy, small bead headed bug. That's got like a copper deal around it. It's a very, very heavy, small bug. So it would be something um, like this is just kind of like a flashy, uh, flashy type pheasant tail type bug, but it's most everything that's wrapped around that, that's, um, you know, soft hackle fly tying material. So these are actually wrapped. I think I have a copper John here somewhere that I can show you or these bloody Marys. These, so these are wrapped with kind of like copper and they're really heavy, even though they're really tiny, it doesn't feel like it in your hand, but they have almost no buoyancy. So something like this that's wrapped around with, uh, like a copper lining when it hits the water it's like a rock it goes straight down even in current even though it's super tiny and it doesn't feel like much in your hand um, the material that's on it is super dense so it falls straight to the bottom so european style they're going to tie on um, your top bug which is going to be your light your lightest bug and then they'll tie on another one and then they're going to have a little tiny one that's their anchor bug and they want it to hit the bottom. They want that bottom bug bouncing the bottom. And then you'd have another fly up and another fly up. Something that it's similar to that you may be familiar with that you've seen in Oklahoma is when people go uh, sand bass fishing or crappie fishing. And you'll see multiple jigs tied on to their line at different increments on the way up. That's essentially what we're doing with nymph fishing. Um, but you can do it with a singular bug. The float, if you do use a strike indicator, that is guaranteeing that even if your bug managed to to stretch the line far enough to get maximum maximum extension from the strike indicator, it's not going to go any deeper. It can't pull the float underwater. Um, now, if you throw out a nymph 
and you actually um, you dead drift it without a float, which is fun because it's kind of like a uh, streamer fishing, except it's not, you're not trying to strip it. You want it to float. So you can't float for nearly as long, right? Cause you're going to hit the bottom eventually. And then you're going to snag up with a float. It obviously keeps all of your bugs off of the bottom of the river and they're able to continue to free float down. So you get a longer stretch, but if you just throw one bug out or maybe two, you only probably have a 20 or 30 foot float window, but man, when a, when a fish comes and gets it and you see that fly line shoot out and you set the hook, it's pretty cool. It's kind of like finesse fishing while nip fishing. Um, but so anyways, we'll just, I'm just going to show you a basic dropper setup. Um, so we'll tie on typically droppers, uh, again, because we're focused on mayflies or something that's attractant. So like a Bloody Mary, this is going to be matching our midges. So midges, when they're in the water, they, they are a lot like mosquitoes, the way that they're shaped. Uh, they don't bite. So when they do hatch and you see swarms of midges, it's not like mosquitoes or, or buffalo gnats or stuff like that that can bite you. Um, but when they're in the water, the stem of their body, actually the hemoglobin that's in it, they glow red. So um, wintertime trout fishing in Oklahoma, if you don't really know a lot about bugs, you can get basic patterns. So this right here is, I'm going to guess this is probably like a 16, a size 16. So again, just like we did um, with uh, the fly line when we're talking about the tippet, the higher number, the smaller we get or the, the less diameter of line that we get. So with bugs, a size zero bug is, you know, something that's going to look like this. And then as we go, we get a size two bug and a four and a six and eight, 12, so on increments of two. Well, when you start to get past 14, that's when you really start to get, you know, these smaller, smaller bugs. And I have some in here, this, these are kind of a favorite of mine, especially if I'm fishing in Montana. Um, you can see how small these are. Um, so this right here is, I think a 20. And this right here, I'm gonna have to hold it on like my thumb. This is like a 22. So that's super tiny. And you can kind of see the eyelid on there. I don't know if it'll adjust for focus, but um, anyways, this little fly deal right here, you know, that eyelid is tiny. So this is 4X that we have on here, which is the equivalent of six pound test. So that just barely squeaks through that eyelid. So that's why we're tying on the tippet and things like that. Um, but little flashy bugs like this, something with an orange body, a uh, little bit of green flake, Bloody Marys, uh, lightning bugs. These are all just, you know, trying to pull reactionary bites. That one's kind of in bad shape. Uh, and then we're going to have, you know, something that's more prototypical, like a, you know, your pheasant tail. So this, a pheasant tail is mimicking a mayfly, whereas, um, you know, some of these other ones are going to be mimicking uh, midges. Midges aren't going to have that tail end on them. Like, you're going to have more like a zebra midge is a pretty typical one, black and white. Black, white, and grays are really good um, uh, color bases if you're not using olive in the fall or in the winter months for trout in Oklahoma. Um, so let's grab, because again, we don't have really big, we don't have a lot of the big bugs here that you will get as you go out west where you have salmon flies and stone flies and things, you know, get really big, really big bugs when they hatch. Um, but when they're nymphs, they're also very big. So typically your um, like, so here's an orange carry special when I was talking about trolling. Uh, I like something that's usually more in a, in an olive or a green shade, which I think I have one. Yeah, right here. So there, there's like one of my favorite carry specials right there. Very earth tone base, but let's tie on a, on a dropper to something that would might work. So let's go with little bead head flashy pheasant tail. This is going to be probably a size 14. Um, we'll get my fly line here. Uh, so almost all of your fly tying, when you're tying your knot on your bug, is going to be an improved clinch. You just, Palomar doesn't go through. Normally you can't double the line over and actually get it through the eyelid. So we're just going to tie on our improved clinch, which is going to twist four or five, six times. I, I tend to lean on the uh, lower side. So I only spin it four or five times. I've seen people who will do it six, seven, 
um, which you can do with really light line. It'll tie better. But if you start getting up into heavier line, um, like 3X, 2X, uh, you're going to have a hard time with seven twists actually pulling it down. So got that cinched on again you would always be cutting your tag end off as close as you can to the knot so there's no exposure um it's gonna look better so now we're gonna tie on our dropper so how do we get another bug off of this right so we have our hook it's up like that we're gonna tie a knot right on here now again you can do a lot of different knots on this um strength of knot is important so an improved clinch is going to be good but sometimes that's hard to do. So if we try to do an improved clinch, we have to take the line, we're going to loop it over that hook and then we're going to twist. We're going to do the same thing that we just did, but now it's kind of a game of keeping the tension with the tippet as well as with the fly so that we can, you have to use lots of fingers to hold everything to keep tension because we lose that tension. That loop is going to hop right off of that hook. Um, so, all right, so we're tied on to that now. Okay, so now we have extra line. Now we can get our secondary bug on. So again, you want your top bug typically to be your lighter bug because you want them equally, you don't want your line trying to pull over itself. So if you put the heavier bug up top and a lighter bug on the bottom, hopefully when you cast out when it's going down that heavier bug is dragging your main line down and then that lighter bug is going to be the end of your line and that's going to be floating up it works um but there's a lot more opportunity for your line to double over itself you start getting wind knots um when you're casting back and forth a lot of times your flies will loop and it'll create a perfect overhand knot and you can run your hand down your line. And if you feel a little knot on there, you're like, how did that get there? I didn't tie a knot. That's a wind knot. It's basically a basic overhand knot. Well, if you do this with tension on a wind knot, an overhand knot's going to snap your line. So you really want to check your line, especially if it's windy. Or if you're nymph fishing and you have a dropper on, you have to be mindful that you're going to get some twists sometimes. Happens to the best of us. And you just... You got to cut them and retie, or you're more than likely going to lose a fish. So how far should you go for your dropper? It's up to you, but, you know, let's say 12 to 12 to 14 inches is about as far as you want to go. Because, again, the farther, the more line you have off when you're trying to cast this thing and it's coming through, the more opportunity it has to do something like that in midair, and you don't even see it. So it's happening when it's out there. So I took about, you know, 14, 16 inches. Um and then I'm going to tie my Bloody Mary on, which it has that copper base. So this is the heavy bug. So unlike a heavier bug up top where it's pulling the main line down, this is pulling the tag end of the line. Um, that might be jammed up. Uh, might not use that. So sometimes nippers, they'll have a little deal on here because you'll get a uh, fly tie. You know, maybe there's some glue in there or um, something's happened, but you got to clean out the eyelid to be able to thread through. Uh, no, this one might actually just have a line in it. Oh, there we go. So you can just push it down on that and then that'll clear out that eyelid for you. Oh yeah, there's old line on there. That happens a lot, especially with little bugs. You try to clip them at, you try to clip the knot off, but a lot of times you clip them right above the knot. It's so small that that'll get folded into the circle of the eye hole. Um, so having nippers on you that have little points like that that are in there, that little point is there to clear your eye hole. You see that a lot with painted jig heads that like crappie anglers use. Sometimes the paint will be in the eye hole and you got to poke through. You can also do it with the hook point of another uh, hook or fly or whatever. So we'll tie this on again, same standard knot, going with the improved clinch. Tie this on. Okay, so now we have our heavy bug. So unlike the heavy bug being on top where it's pulling the main line down with this, this is gonna pull down. So now this is my anchor bug. This is more kind of a European nymph style uh, of where you know a fish is gonna hit. Now, as you can see, there's obviously the line on both sides of, of this first bug. 
which you're like, man, what if a fish comes up and it's going to hit the line? Yeah, happens a lot. Most of the time you hook up fish on the end bug. I mean, that's just how it works out. Um, just because the hook success rate from this, there's so many things that can happen where maybe that fish feels the line when it comes in to get it. It hits it and it bows the, you know, the leader line out, anything like that. But that's your typical, that's your dropper. And that's a nymph dropper. This is effective, um, you know, throughout Oklahoma flowing water, things like pheasant tails, lightning bugs, bloody Marys, copper johns, any type of like a zebra midge or like a psycho purple prince midge. Um, you know, you can even trick them on something like maybe like a crackback caddis. It's got like a little yellow. It's not typical. It's not really matching anything um, for them here. But you can get away with some of that stuff more so than you would with native or wild fish that are really, they know exactly what the size of the bugs are. But again, like if I was, if I was planning on uh, nymph fishing on any of the Oklahoma waters, this right here, what I just tied on, where does that go? Right here. These bugs are too big for, for my liking. Even that, way too big. This right here. That might be as big as I go. I'm looking at tying on things. Uh, where's my finger at? There we go. Something like that. Very, very small. Um, so if you can get a really, really small Bloody Mary or Copper John or something that's got that copper around it that's going to pull down without having to add split shots so you can still throw a really nice line, um, you're just going to be more successful the smaller. So if you think that fish are feeding, especially in the clear water, um, I cannot overemphasize polarized glasses. Um, I grew up fishing rivers and creeks. It's essential. You need to be able to see not only for the fish, because a lot of times you can sight fish, you can see them flashing, you can see where they're holding, um, but for your own safety, especially in the wintertime, you're probably, you're going to be wearing waders. So Having polarized glasses on, they don't have to be expensive. You can get them at a gas station for five bucks. But especially if you're fly fishing, that line is going back and forth all day, right? If the wind's blowing, one of those, no glasses on, hits in the eye. I cannot tell you how many times I've bounced flies, lures, whatever off of my glasses. Um, they're going to protect your eyes. They're going to allow you to see into the water because they take the light refraction off the top. It's going to help you safety. Um, but Oklahoma, typically mostly dirty water, except for the eastern part of the state um, and some western bodies of water that have really good uh, either vegetation or aeration. Um, but polarized glasses when you're when you're in the river, for sure. Um, can't stress that enough, just, just for safety. It's cold water. You got waders on. You step somewhere that you didn't see. Your foot goes too far. Water gets above your waders. It fills your waders up. Water's 45 degrees. It's pretty easy to drown, pretty easy, you know, to lose, you know, getting uh, early stages of hyperthermia kicks in really quick, that shock. So importance for safety, for sure. Um, so we've done, we've got our nymphs. Uh, like I said, the smaller, the better. If you, if you think fish are there, if you can see them, you can see them feeding. Um, trout, their kind of telltale sign is you know, they blend in real good with those nice green backs for the rainbows that we stock. So, but every occasionally you'll see that little bit of a flash and that's a fish, you know, dodging over to grab something that's floating down. So if you see them feeding on something and you're just throwing it right through there and they're just refusing, 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 before you try to change bugs or change patterns or something like that, always buy bugs, especially nymphs, you know, start at like a size 16 and work your way with that same exact pattern of bug all the way to a 22, maybe even a 24 um, and downsize, downsize, downsize. Cause more than likely it's not what you're throwing. It's the size of what you're throwing and that goes for dry fly fishing. If you see bugs coming up off the water and you actually hold one in your hand, you want to be a size smaller than that because what it looks like when it's on the top of the water, you get that light refraction and they're coming up to hit. So most of the time success for fly fishing in Oklahoma is a byproduct of you are fishing with too big of a fly. So now let's get up towards the surface. So in the winter time, like I said, midges, mayflies, uh, blueing olives. So your, 
your BWOs and your pale morning duns um, are going to be your basic fly patterns. Gray bodies, maybe a very light yellow body. Um, let me see what I have in here. I really like these for mayflies. Um, again, we're not matching specifically on the hatch, but this is kind of a little uh, spinner. So this is, this is replicating the bug. It's come up, it's emerged, it's laid its eggs, and now it's dying. Um, so it's a spinner, so it's coming down and it's, it's gone through its life cycle. So flies, when they hatch on the water, their lifespan's not very long. Um, it can be as short as like five minutes. So they've lived their entire life, maybe years in the river as a nymph. And then when they get that perfect opportunity, they move up into the water column, they lose that nymph casing, they bring their wings out, they come up as an emerger, and they get up into the water film on the top, and it takes them a minute to dry that water off before they can take off. So fish are hitting emergers when they're coming off and then you get the big plumes of bugs that come up, then they breed. Sometimes they're breeding, they come down, they smack the water and they lay the eggs. Um, and then after they've completed that cycle, they die. So then they fall back down as spinners and they float in the water and they're kind of kicked like that. So this is uh, maybe size 18, but that really light I'm trying to get the focus doesn't really want to work with me, but there's a little bit of a purple flash in there, um, but that kind of light yellow color, um, even almost into a gray, it kind of almost looks gray from a distance. Uh, let's see if we have some morning guns in here somewhere. Here's more of like an elk hair version of, of that bug. But again, the smaller, the smaller you can go, the better. And something like this, once you start getting into 18s and 20s for dry flies, um, what a lot of people will do is they'll tie on a dropper as well. So you'll actually have dry, dry. So what you'll do is you'll put a big bug out front, like a big elk hair caddis or something like that, um, that you can really see that maybe it's got like a red, red knob on the top. And that's kind of your indicator bug. And then behind it, that's also a dry fly is going to be your really, really, really small, you know, size 18, size 20, size 22 that you with your own eye, probably can't see when it's on the water. These are meant to sit low in the water film because they're, they're acting as a dying bug. So it's not like a terrestrial, like a grasshopper or a salmon fly or stone fly where when it lands, you can clearly see that most of its body is up out of the water. Spinners are going to be just like emergers. They're going to kind of be in that film. So they're really hard to pick up. So you can actually use another dry fly as your indicator. So what you're watching, instead of trying to see that little fly that you know is going to come up and get eaten, and you might not be able to see the boil, or you might not see the tension on the line, and you have a split second on the dry fly, because those fish, they hit it, they feel the hook, they let it go. Um, so it's a timing game. So you would take something, um, you know, you might try like a little ant, or you know, something big like this that you can see. It's, it's probably not going to get bit. Um, you know, if you can use something that might match what you have going on, definitely by all means do that. But if you can't, but you really, you, you don't want to try to play the game of watching the end of your fly line for any type of movement, or even knowing how far your leader is and judging where that bug hit the water and then trying to follow along where you think it's at and looking for a strike, you'd use something like this. So this will be floating along in the water. You're watching it and all of a sudden it'll stop or it'll, you know, twitch, that's when you set the hook because something's disturbed that dropper and it's going to look just like this. You're going to do the same exact thing. You're going to tie on your dry fly and then you're going to take, you probably take a little bit more um, if you're doing dry, dry, or if you're doing a dry nymph dropper, you're going to want to take more than if you're just nymph fishing with two nymphs where we're only using about 14 inches. You might use two, two feet behind this um, all the way up to about 30 inches if you're going to do a dry, dry dropper, or if you're going to do a dry nymph dropper. So a dry nymph dropper, this is really not going to come into play in Oklahoma in the winter um, because you're not going to have big bugs on the water as well as um, nymphs. And if you try to use a dry that would work, which is going to be something like uh, a mayfly, you know, something really small, like a, min a morning done um, or a blueing olive, you're probably not going to be able to tie a nymph off of it because it's going to drag that dry fly down into the water, which now it's no longer effective. So really don't have to worry about a dry nymph dropper in Oklahoma. Um, but that, that kind of covers that as far as, uh, as 
as far as fly fishing goes, um, I'm going to start reading through the questions. We've got about 15 minutes here. So if anybody, if we didn't cover a topic, if I went too fast, if you joined late, if you've got something, uh, throw it in the chat bar and I'm going to start going through those and answering questions for the next 15 minutes until we finish. So I think the last one we left up on, uh, what's best for creeks with lots of rocks at the bottom and you want your bait to sit so it doesn't get snagged. Um, so for that, again, these egg weights are great. Um, put the little eyelid on them. In it, I mean, you're still probably going to find snags occasionally, but something like this that is just enough weight to where you want to cast. So when you're trying to bait fish in moving water and you want to hold the bottom, cast 45 degrees downstream to begin with. Let that go out. Try to pick your spot of where you want to land it. Get it pretty close, but upstream of it. Reel up your slack. When that thing hits the bottom, get all the slack out of your line and try to get your rod set. If you're the type of person who holds on your rod, great. It's easier to do. If you want to put it in uh, your lawn chair, you want to put it in a rod holder, get that thing out. The second it hits the water, put it into your rod holder and let that line, let this weight bounce on the bottom and it should be enough to hold. Now it's going to try to swing back towards you. So you want to cast across the current, let the current grab it and pull it to where it's probably 60, 70 degrees downstream of you. And something like that's going to hold the bottom. Um, but this, this shape is better for it bouncing. It won't necessarily get drug up underneath stuff. So something like that's going to be your best way to hold the bottom without getting snagged up. Um, the, this is going to be way too small. This is an eighth ounce. If you're using, you're going to want to use something that's probably a quarter ounce for maybe Blue River. And then if there's faster parts of like the lower Illinois um, or lower Mountain Fork, you're looking at probably a half ounce. Um, and then Robbers Cave and Medicine Creek are going to fish similar to Blue. They're a little less flow, um, but an eighth ounce will usually work in that. Uh, where are we at next? Uh, can you use rainbows as cut bait in other bodies of water? If you legally harvest a game fish by um, legal means of take, so in Trout's case, rod and reel, if you catch your fish and you're done, you're done fishing because um, you can't be in possession of fillets while actively engaged in fish. So you couldn't sit on your cooler or whatever on the river, or river bank or uh, lake bank and be catching fish and actively cleaning those fish while you're still engaged in fishing. That's against the law now, but if you legally harvest your fish, you can do whatever you want with it. So you're done fishing. You caught your six, uh, your six rainbows, right? You're going to take them home. You're going to eat them. You filleted those fish out. And now you have rainbow heads. Yeah. You can go throw those on a jug line and throw them on a, um, you know, big three off hook or something like that and go fishing. As long as you caught a game species in Oklahoma with legal means of take, you are allowed to use it as cut bait. So you can use bass as cut bait. You can use crappie as cut bait as long as you caught them legally. Unlike shad or rough fish where you might throw a throw net to catch them before you go to bait your jug lines or before you go catfishing or something like that, you cannot net a game fish. It's an illegal means of take. But if you catch them using legal means of take, you can use them however you want. Just do not be in possession of fish parts, so fillets, while actively engaged in fishing. Um, it's a little bit tricky. Like if you're out on the lake crappie fishing or whatever, trout fishing, you caught your fish, you're on a boat and you've cleaned them and now you're using them, you're, you're illegally fishing at that point. So you need to go back to the boat ramp or if you're camping out somewhere at a lake, go back to your truck, go back to your campsite, clean your fish, put them in the cooler, and then you can use the parts of the fish that you're not going to eat. You can then take those back to the lake and use them as bait. Uh, does the state have any information posted on how to handle trout for success? Great question. We talked about it, but we didn't really touch on what that means. So again, trout, super finicky fish. Um, they just, they're not hardy. They, they die if you look at them funny. Um, the best handling practices, if you are not using a net. So if you're just going to scoop that thing up, and, but you want to release it, wet your hands first. Keep your hands wet. And this goes for every fish. Um, if you are handling fish, you sh your hand should always be wet. So fish have a, a coat, slime on them that helps protect them against infection, bacterial infection. It's, it's their skin protect. It's their skin's protection. So 
humans lo use lotion and things like that to, you know, help our skin. We use sunscreen. So that's what a fish has on it to keep it from parasites and bacteria. And they have slime. If you go, the oils on your hands, if you go and grab that fish, you'll actually sometimes see fish that somebody grabbed on the back and you might catch that fish later after a couple of weeks and you will actually see the finger marks on the fish where bacteria or an infection has grown. Um, if you're using a net, got one right here. If you plan on releasing the fish, this is a rubber net. Don't use cloth, don't use mesh, rope, anything like that. And what's gonna do, it's gonna, again, it's gonna cut through that fish with the rubber, it gets wet, it acts like your hand. So best, uh, safest fish handling tips um, for getting the fish in and out of the water, wet hands, rubber net, nothing else. Anything else is going to hurt the fish. Um, hook removals, things like that. Don't lip the fish like a bass. Don't grab it in the mouth. You want to hold it underneath up right behind the pectoral fins, which are going to be right behind the gill plates. Don't hold it up in front of the pectoral fins because you're going to hurt the gill plates and their gills kind of stick out right there. And it, again, they'll pull right out. Um, if you happen to deep hook a fish, if it gets beyond the tongue patch and it's actually made it to the gullet where you can see that little, you know, like balloon knot that looks like that in the back. If it's made it through that where you can't see your hook, cut your line. Um, like I said earlier, they make those little uh, red toy shaped looking guns. That's a deep hook remover. You're going to kill the fish. Um, if it's gutted it and you want to take it, cut, cut the line. Um, don't even attempt to try to go. If it's beyond the tongue patch and you try to go get it, you're probably going to kill the fish. Um, uh, is it if possible to show the resulting knots with the dark shirt behind the back? Kind of hard to see the white background. Uh, yeah, so for the knots, let's, we can do a couple here real quick. Um, I think probably the one you're talking about is the blood knot. That was probably the hardest one to see. But we'll do we'll do a couple of different knots here so that everybody can see. Um, I'll tie. We'll do two on kind of this bigger deal so it's easier to see and try to tie it. Uh, we'll see if the dark background on my shirt works like you suggested. I don't know though. I don't know if that's going to be much better. It might actually be easier up in that light. But let's see if we get like right in here. Let's try. Okay, so our two basic tying on knots. First one's gonna be the Palomar. So we're just gonna double over the tag end of our line, just like that. And then that's gonna go through the eyelid. And then we're gonna tie a overhand knot. So we've created an overhand knot with our loop. And we're gonna take our loop that we've created and we're gonna work the lure through the loop. So all the way at the end, that's going to go over the top and it's going to pull up like that. And then you're going to wet the line. Cinch tight. So that's our Palomar. That's more of a bass fishing knot. It's easy to tie on big uh, eyelids, not nearly as easy on little tiny flies. So that's why we do the improved clinch. The improved clinch is we take the tag end, and we go straight through the eyelid with the tag end. We don't double it over. We grab it and we pull it up the main line. And then we're going to twist the lure or the eyelid. This, this one, the eyelid's not attached. So I'm going to twist the eyelid as opposed to the lure. We're going to create four or five twists. And then we're going to take the tag end. And right here, you can see that loop at the end, right here on the eyelid. We're gonna take the tag end, we're gonna go through that loop, which creates a secondary loop, and we're gonna go back through that secondary loop. Then you're gonna grab the tag end, you're gonna pull it up the line, wet the line, cinch it tight. And then we will do a blood knot real quick. So we have, 5X and 4X, fairly comparable. Again, you either want to be tying the same diameter line to line or one size below. Don't try to do it with three or four sizes different. You'll just run into all types of problems. Every now and then, you might be able to get it perfectly, but it's still not a great knot to have. So 
with the blood knot, we're just, the whole purpose is attaching line to line. So this isn't for another hook. We just want to get line to line. So again, you're going to want to get one end about four inches. Um, you get any bit longer than that. Uh, it's kind of hard to pull them back through. If you get too short, you're not going to be able to create. So four inches is kind of ha happy medium. So we're going to take our two pieces of line and we're going to cross them and we're going to create that little V and then you're just going to pinch it off. So we're going to take one end. You're going to wrap it under the line. You're going to do this four or five times. And then you're going to take that tag end and you're going to bring it back through the V, the newly created V. And you're going to pinch it, pinch it through. So now we have, it's kind of hard to see the underside, but you now have your little point. Well, this other tag end, now that we've gone through that V notch, get that. Again, you start to get twisting. and So you really want to pinch that thing tight once you've made your, your way down one side of the line. Um, and then you just take the other one and go the exact opposite direction down that line a couple of times or four or five times. And now where we threw that tag through the V, we've now created a loop right there where that, where that tag end went through right there. So we're going to go back through the opposite direction with that tag end. We're going to grab both tag ends. We're going to pull them in opposite directions from each other. So we created the two loops like that. And you're going to grab one piece, like I said, if you got really big hands, we, we wet the line. Kind of screwed that up, but um, it's easier when one one end is attached to something as opposed to them both being loose. Um, where this might not look very good. Might not be through the right. Okay, so. But essentially what it's doing is it's pulling both of those little loop knots and it pulls them together to look like that. So not great. It's really hard with this on the, on the live screen camera. Uh, we can do some how to videos. Uh, everybody who is on this call that got the email for the link to it. There's also a link where this will be housed after we're done with this, where you can go back and watch it. Um, and we have our other virtual courses on there. We also have a how to series that we're doing. Um, and I can do some more advanced knot tying with a better background, some better lighting um, so that we can do some of this because it's really hard to do um, with you guys right here uh, with this lighting. Because like you said, it's hard to see even on the dark background. Um, where are the fish biting at during this time of year in Oklahoma? So again, it's November. Your best options are going to be the lower Mountain Fork and the lower Illinois. Those fish are year round. Um, if you go to Perry, if you go to Watonga, you go to Medicine Creek, Sunset Lake, Robbers Cave, um, those seasonal Blue River. Blue River is probably your best bet. Um, you're, you're more typically going to have early season success at Blue River because it is in a creek. Um, those fish are closer together. The water is a little bit cooler than Medicine Creek can be. Um, but Medicine Creek, Blue River, um, and then maybe Robbers Cave best options for right now in November. Now, as you start to get into December, January, February, all of our trout fisheries are going to be fishing. Um, good. They're all going to be a little bit different how you fish. I mean, you have to learn those. You got to go out and, and figure it out. Um, but all the things we've talked about today, I've pieced all these together from fishing all these different areas. So I'm bringing it to you in more of a general broad scope. Um, you know, there's some places where that olive rooster tail is better than everything else. There's sometimes that brown rooster tail at a certain body water, like the lower mountain fork. I like that brown one over the green one. I go to the lower Illinois. I like the green one over the brown one. Um, if I'm at Perry triple C, I like to power bait fish those little shallow coves. Um, if I go to Watonga, might put a float tube out there and um, 
and troll a woolly bugger or something like that. So they all kind of have their own differences. Um, but as far as the actual bite picking up, your best bet right now in November for the seasonal is going to be Blue River um, and then Medicine Park and Robbers Cave um, because the lakes are still a little warm. They take some time um, with the moving water that dissolved oxygen is a little bit higher um, than it's going to be in some of the surface areas on those uh, still water that naturally has less dissolved oxygen in it than flowing water does. So stick to rivers and creeks in November. Um, and then as you get into January and February, you're going to see more fish that have been stocked um, in um, those still like Perry and Watonga. They're going to have more fish in them than they did in November and the water is going to be colder. So the fishery is really going to improve at that point. Um, when you purchase a one day pass this late in the season, does it automatically offer you a rest of the year license? Um, so we do have a, fi a fiscal year fishing license that runs through the end of the year. Um, but you, I guess your question, if you purchase a one day pass, does it automatically offer you the rest of the year license? Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. Um, you know, one day permit is a one day permit, but if you're looking to buy an annual license, um, you know, you might want to wait until January. So it, so it rolls over, but we are in talks of creating a data purchase license. So that's something to look forward to in the future, hopefully here. Um, in the next year or so, we will have a data purchase license. So if you buy a fishing license on you know, November 17th, it's going to be good until November 16th of the next year. Um, that's not currently an option. We have an annual, a fiscal, and then a, um, you know, our, our one and six day licenses and things like that. Um, what indicator do you prefer when using that midge? Um, if I'm using a midge nymph, just a basic circular um, strike indicator. Uh, they, they look like little tiny, uh, like they kind of look like jawbreakers or uh, like a gumball. They're about a gumball size. And then they have a little eyelid on them. And you basically just double over the line and go through it and then push the ball through and then pull it tight. And then you can adjust your line. Um, those are the easiest indicators to use. If you're talking about using a dry with a midge, um, I mean, anything that's going to stay afloat, probably foam body bug, something like, you know, something that mimics a grasshopper or an ant, but the body of where the hook shank comes through, it's a foam base as opposed to a dry fly um, that's, you know, like a big, elk hair caddis or something where the body is actually going to be fly tying material. It's going to be soft tackle type things. Your foam body, if you're going to use a, a dry as your indicator. Um, but if you're just getting a, a synthetic artificial, like a, a bobber or strike indicator, then uh, any fly shop is going to probably sell three packs or five packs. They're about that big. Um, they used to have ones that came where you had a little stopper on both ends and you put your line through a little metal wire and then pull the stopper on. And then you put the indicator on the line ran through it. And then you put another stopper on and you can move them up and down. I haven't seen those in a while. Those were kind of a pain now. And they also have ones that are made more like cloth. Um, and you'd actually have to dip them and float them to keep them up because they wouldn't stay up. But they kind of uh, come a long way now where there's hard plastic that floats very hardy that's going to be your best nymph indicator that you can use um sorry i pull in and trout on blue river with a fly line an indicator what you suppose was below the indicator dealer's choice on that um uh again i would imagine that he's that somebody who's nymph fishing uh is going to be something in you your pheasant tail, any pheasant tail, the smaller a pheasant tail, that's going to be your best nymph bug in Oklahoma. So that's, that's your mayfly bug. Um, coloration of them, again, browns, olives, grays. Um, but Bloody Marys, Copper Johns, lightning bugs, things like that that are flashy. Um, but anything that's going to fall in the mayfly or the midge, those so. Any nymph that is patterning a mayfly or a midge, that's what you want to stick with. That those are your those are your two bugs that exist in the water. That's going to be natural. Um, so I would assume probably something like that. 
um, a prince nymph or a pheasant tailed nymph, something like that. Um, what is your suggestion for point fly? 18 on top, 16 on bottom, 20 or 18. Um, again, as small as you can go, uh, if you can, if you're going to do a top, I mean, if you have a dry and you're going to fish a dropper, that's a nymph. Like I said, that's not really effective in Oklahoma in the winter. Cause you're not, you're not going to be able to throw a dry fly that is going to get any action because it's going to have to be big enough to hold on to that nymph. Um, so a dry fly that would be effective with a nymph dropper, that dry fly is going to be so small and soft tackle, it's going to get drug under the water. So then it's rendered ineffective. So your nymphing in Oklahoma should be under, should either be free lining, you know, your dead drifting nymphs without an indicator, or you're using an actual strike indicator. Um, if you're using another fly or a bug for that, you're just kind of wasting a fly. Um, it's just going to be out there. So uh, your dries, like I said, mayflies and midges, you're looking at size six. If you can get them to bite a 16, great. Um, but you're probably looking at more 20, 22. Um, same thing with your nymphs, 16. If you can get away with the 16, great. If you, But if you're not getting bit, it's probably because you need to go couple sizes smaller. Um, are you stocking Robert's cave this year? Yes, we are stocking. I've heard that a couple of times. I, I heard this past weekend that uh, parts of the park were shut down because they were filming a movie out there. But as far as the stocking, um, yeah, that Robert's cave gets stocked. Uh, what is proper etiquette regarding spacing? If I'm bait fishing near fly fishermen, uh, Depends on who you ask. Um, again, it's Oklahoma. So, you know, this is not a typical fly fishing state. Um, you know, the majority of anglers in the state are not fly anglers. That varies greatly as you go west or you go east or you go north. Then you really start having to where fly fishermen might be the majority of anglers in the state. So then when it comes to etiquette, you're going to probably lean more towards the fly angler. In Oklahoma, you know, use common sense like if if somebody's fly fishing they're obviously using a lot of the river you know during for a run because they're having to cast upstream and float through that run so if they look like they've been set up there for a while odds are there's a better hole to bait fish that they can't get to especially on the lower mountain fork um and that's probably where you're going to run into the most fly fishing traffic throughout the duration of the river um those little pockets, especially now that the mountain fork has changed so much with flooding and it's stripped all the substrate that's out of there. And now it's a uh, barbless hook only for the entire river on the mountain fork. So um, going up into the spillway Creek, there's lots of waterfalls that go through there, but it creates back eddies and weird flows or it's too fast to water. And it makes it difficult for the fly guys to get into some of those pockets. Um, if you're just at like blue river, you know, 10, 10 feet downstream of where a guy's drift ends is probably good enough etiquette. Um, you know, but it's common sense. It's the same thing you do if you were, um, white bass fishing or crappie fishing when it's good, you know, you kind of, you kind of feel it out when you get there, you test the temperature of everybody else who's around you. You know, what are, what are they acting like? Are they cool with, is it party fishing? Is everybody shoulder to shoulder having a good time? Or is it kind of like, Hey man, why don't you move down a few feet? And then with COVID right now, obviously, probably safe to stay two rod lengths away from everybody when you're out there fishing, maybe even more now um, as we move into the winter months. So staying socially distanced, things like that. But there isn't a there's a, I wish I could give you a, a foot or a yardage like this is what we say is etiquette. But it's it's going to vary from place to place and and even on day to day, depending on who's there. Do we publish a stocking schedule? Um, no. Uh, and for this reason. Fish are stocked in our seasonal trout areas every two weeks. We cannot provide an accurate date because lots of things can happen. Now, very rarely does stocking get interrupted and we'll let the public know. We'll put out a news release if an area isn't getting stocked for, you know, in more than a two week period. If something's come up that's affected that. Um, but what happens is, is, these trout do not come from the Department of Wildlife's fish hatcheries. They're, we buy these fish, um, and so they're act they actually come in from a different state. 
and they, they bring them in on hauling trucks. Any number of things can happen. Um, a truck can break down, inclement weather, things can happen at a hatchery that we said it was going to be stocked on Tuesday, but now it was stocked on Wednesday or it was stocked on Monday. But every um, seasonal trout fishery in the state is stocked every two weeks and the year round trout fisheries are stocked every week. So, and the fish in the year round fishery come from federal hatcheries. Um, they're not a part of our seasonal trout that we get. So those entirely different batch of trout, but you know, November 1st, November 15th, November 30th, you know, those aren't the exact dates, but every two weeks throughout the course of the stocking and that's, but we don't publish it because there's just, there's no way to ensure accuracy. We, we would love to tell you exactly when they're going to get there, but um, I've been waiting at a boat ramp, you know, to, to work and a truck doesn't show up. So it, it happens to us where we don't even know. Sometimes we get a phone call, truck breaks down. Um, is it barbless at Blue River? Um, only in the catch and release zone. So that restricted area that's on the very northern end of the property, um, that's going to be artificial lures and flies only. It's going to be barbless hooks, but um, everything downstream of that. And there's a big cable that runs across the river that says uh, catch and release zone only. But outside of that, you can use bait and barbed hooks. Um, there's also another small area on the lower Illinois that has that same restriction. Um, but we, the mountain fork up until this year was actually the most um, complicated regulations we had for trout fishing. There was the most, we broke up those two zones. There was lots of different um, length limits, creel, everything. So we tried to standardize it because we want to create a trophy trout fishery there um, for the future. So within the next decade, we would like to see some trophy brown trout and some rainbows in that second area where it's a 30 inch minimum now for brown trout. and It's a 25 inch minimum for rainbows. Um, if you're familiar with the lower mountain fork where the spillway comes in at the dam, you have that nice big hole and then it runs down the chute through the canyon and then it gets down to the bottom. And now where Lost Creek got washed out by the flooding is a big gravel parking lot. State Parks has done a great job. ODWC's heavy equipment uh, maintenance people have done a great job of, of really cleaning that area up. Um, the actual access for the entirety of the river is now better than it's ever been because of uh, all the substrate got washed away. So now there's lots of bank access and good wading access. Um, but the evening hole, so the, the second 259 bridge that's there below that, it goes over a little low water and it turns into more of kind of this slow slagged out water where you have some grass growth on the bottom and big boulders. And it's very conducive to growing carnivorous big trout. So, um, but to standardize the whole area now, it's just barbless hooks throughout. Um, now that's going to be a problem for most bait fishermen. Um, you know, these flies like this, the barbs on them, most of the times the hooks are not like bass hooks. They're not meant to be terminal um, flies. Fly fishing really evolved as a catch and release type sport. So the hooks have that in mind. So when you go to clip a barb on a hook like this, you know, it doesn't take much. You just have to go over and bend it a little bit. And that thing pretty much folds over. But if we have um, like snell hooks, it's really hard. Like if you're a power bait angler and you're going to the lower mountain fork, um, these guys like that, that's a pretty hardy hook. Um, you can see the density of these things. They're not, you can't bend them very easily. So that hook's going to be a little bit harder to turn over, but unfortunately it's really hard to find hooks in retail, like in the store that are barbless. You could probably, you can buy them online barbless, but, um, pinching them down and the standard rule of thumb with game wardens. So if you're fishing in an area that needs to be barbless, uh, take a piece of paper out and when you've pinched down that barb, if you can push it through the piece of paper and pull it back out without catching, good to go. Even if it looks like there's a little bit of a nub there, if it goes up and comes straight out, you, you won't be written a ticket. Any game wardens will, will settle for that. And, you know, don't worry about pinching that barb until you go to tie your hook on. Like you don't need to a box like like this with all your rooster tails. If you're going on a trip to Lower Mountain Fork. Don't sit there and clip all your barbs. These are expensive, and you know you're going to use them for other species and other places. So, um, but the easiest way to work over a barb is like on a hook that was not necessarily intended. Now this is not a good example because that's a really weak hook. We'll grab one of these rooster tails. These are way hardier hooks. 
but when you go to when you go to turn these things over there's kind of a particular way that you should look now these pliers are not great for this um, with the grooves you really want something with more of a flat surface because the hook point can actually land in those grooves and you don't get as good of a bend but what you want to do to really get an effective barbless so you can see a little barb right there you want to take those pliers start right above the barb so i'm not over the barb i'm on top of it and get to where you're just right on top of it and give it one good pinch and then work the pliers further down the stem and when you go to uh, pinch it turn your hand so turn the bottom of the plier into the base of the treble hook like try to turn that into that so where it's kind of turning the hook point inward towards the lure and that's going to be the quickest way to bend those barbs over um, but again a lot of these like with treble hooks you can actually take the treble hook off so if you can purchase barbless treble hooks you don't have to go through you know you just pop these treble hooks off and then attach a uh, a barbless one and then you can rotate back and forth uh that gets us through the ends of the questions um We've gone a little bit over time here, but I can talk, I can talk fishing and I can talk trout all day. So, uh, I'll give it, I'll give it 30 seconds. If nobody's got any other questions, uh, go ahead and, uh, sign out. Um, cause when I click out, it's going to record this video, um, or finish the recording. It'll immediately be available on our, on this channel, our outdoor Oklahoma channel. And then the link that I provided all of you in the email to our fishing resources page that houses all of our virtual courses um, here in the next half hour, I'll get it up on that, uh, on our website as well. So there'll be different opportunities. Um, if this was helpful, or if you just came for general fishing information, our next course is, um, it's going to be next month. Uh, let me see what day that is. It's going to be December, December 8th. We are talking about wintertime cat fishing in particular blue cats and how to catch big fish and lots of catfish during the bitter cold months where most people are trout fishing or they're deer hunting. They're not out trying to catch catfish, but catfishing gets really good in the winter, especially for blue cats, um, primarily for blue cats. Um, so that's our next one that's coming up. But again, all these courses are recorded and then they're made available immediately afterwards. Uh, has Delisi been stocked yet? No, it gets stocked on December 1st. The The two urban trout fisheries, Delisi and Veterans, um, they have a shorter season, smaller body of water, takes longer to kind of get the, the dissolved oxygen. So those are stocked from December 1 through the season itself is December 1 through February, the end of February. So they're going to get stocked every two weeks from um, December through the second week of February. Anything else? If not, I'm going to go ahead and end this stream. All right. Well, thank you all uh, for attending. Again, my name is Skylar St. Ives. Uh, if you go to wildlifedepartment.com and click on our fishing resources page, my contact info is down at the bottom. Uh, if you are joining us because you registered and you got the email, you obviously have my email and my phone number and things like that. Always available to chat uh, as the season goes along. If you have any trout specific questions, feel free to call me, write me an email. Um, I usually am uh, usually really quick with email. You send me an email, I'll probably get back to you really, like, you know, within a couple of minutes most of the time. Um, phone calls, I'll tr I try to return. I get lots of calls during the day. So I usually, it usually goes to voicemail, but then I try to return calls in the evening when people are home after work. Um, easier to talk fishing. Uh, when you're not sitting at your desk at your job trying to hide from your boss. So, uh, but my contact's there. So you guys want to talk fishing uh, or got questions, you know where to find me. So thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Hope you learned something. Uh, tight lines and stay safe out there. Till next time. <laughs>